Okay, is there a mover for that petition? Councillor Bolton and seconded by Councillor Kavanagh. Any further questions or comments? In that case, I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Thank you, councillors. We're now moving on to reports from Committee to Council. Uh, we've first got RCC 2316, Friends of LA Committee, Committee meeting minutes for the 19th of July 2016. Is there a mover for those minutes? I'm happy to move them. No, is, it is there a seconder? Yep, Councillor Bolton. Any questions or comments? Um, Mr. Higginbotham, this, uh, can I please ask what this is referring to? It's quite unusual to approach it. Okay, it's been noted. Thank you. No problem. Uh, all those in favour of the Friends of LAU minutes? All those against? Declare that carried. Next got RCC 2416, Morland Library's Advisory Committee meeting minutes from the 30th of August 2016. Councillor Hopper is moving those minutes. Is there a seconder? Councillor Gillies. Any questions or comments? Councillor Hopper. I just wanted to reflect on the excellent service ratings that we continue to get at our library service. Um, in fact, the report notes that um, this is the best results that we've received for our customer service survey um, in the history of us conducting this survey. So many congratulations <laughs> to our library staff for continuing to provide an excellent service. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hopper. Does anyone wish to add anything further? In that case, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against, I declare that carried. Next got RCC 2516, Performing Arts Mall and Councillor Rob Thompson. Is there a seconder? Councillor Gilly, uh, sorry, Lenka Thompson? Councillor Thompson. Can I move it with an amendment um, just uh, to the report on, reflected on page 23, um, in particular the Brunswick Beethoven Festival. Uh, it indicates an attendance below the spectacular number that was actually there of 685, so effectively a bit more than that. Um, I'd just like to move the report um, and commend it to Council. Um, once again, <coughs> Pam um, was involved with a number of uh, events this year, uh, particularly the Brunswick Beethoven Festival, which, uh, which was once again spectacularly run and well received by our community. And I, I look forward to, uh, to seeing that again next year and being run again next year. And hopefully we can improve on the 685 numbers that we've got. So uh, thank you, Council, for my indulgence. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor L. Thompson, do you wish to add anything uh, further? Yes, just quickly to thank um, Performing Arts Mall and Board uh, for producing another successful event on the Sydney, Sydney Road Street Festival and the Brunswick uh, Music Festival, as long as, as alongside the Beethoven Music Festival as well. Um, they're a, a volunteer board, so they obviously produce something that's um, very significant for the community, and now that's come back in house to the council. So I look forward to those festivals being run from um, from council in, in the future. Thank you very much, Councillor Thompson. Is there any other councillor that wishes to speak to this item? Um, I just had a yes, question. Yes, Councillor Hopper. Um, can I ask, would it normally be the case that we would receive the financial statements as part of this report, or is that separate? Question. Is uh, the Director of Social Development like to answer that? Yes, please. Um, through you, Mayor, I believe they're coming as a separate item because I'm looking at mm. former members here just to see if you can help as well. Yeah. I think they, it's, they have to be audited and concluded, okay. so yeah. I'm guessing that's where that's, that's coming. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'll put that item to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Thank you, councillors. We're now moving on to question time. Um, councillors, also given that it's caretaker period, we have to have a, there's a procedural um, requirement first. Enable question time to be included in the agenda during caretaker period. I'll need a formal resolution from council. If question time is not allowed, any and all questions received tonight will be taken on notice and responded to by an officer post this meeting. So I'd like to move that council resolve to accept questions from the gallery, gallery for a period of 30 minutes. I'm um, happy to second. I also have a question. Yes. If it's not meant to be included in the, in the agenda, why is it listed in the agenda? The CEO. So the local law um, assumes its inclusion all the time, except for the caretaker period meeting, where it assumes its exclusion. Now, it was included in the agenda because it was considered a standard agenda, and what we've done is gone through to make sure everything that has to be done for this to actually happen properly tonight is being done. So we could have made a call and or we could have just not included it or could have, I mean, there's other ways to, to deal with that, but I'm not, you know, ultimately it's, it's giving you a chance to consider whether you do it or not. Okay. 
Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Is, are there any further questions? So, so we're just asking that question time be included in the agenda. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. So this is an opportunity, and we have 30 minutes, for citizens of Moreland to raise questions with councillors. I'd like to remind everyone that the local law gives priority to questions relating to matters on the agenda. Um, councillors um, may not be in a position to respond um, to some of them due to caretaker restrictions, um, but we will, um, officers, and we will endeavour to respond where appropriate. Um, a maximum of two questions is allowed per person. A maximum of three questions will be heard on any subject. Council will then proceed to the next subject, retaining the previous one, if time allows. Uh, we have about 30 minutes. We want to make sure that we hear all the questions. So I, I ask that we don't enter into debate, but we'll try our best to answer the question tonight, if not take it on notice and provide a response subsequent to this meeting. So we're commencing question time at approximately 7.25. And our first question is from Helen Philippoulos uh, in relation to a uh, street tree um, in North Fitzroy. Would you like to come to the lectern, please, and address your question? Hello. Um, do I have to? Hi, um, it's, a, it's been an ongoing issue, and basically it's just something that we need resolved. Yeah. Um, when I say an ongoing issue, it's it's, currently been two years and I still haven't been able to build my family home or because of an existing street tree that we have tried everything possible to meet your demands and your needs. To make it easier, I know I've got three minutes, but what I'll do, I'll just read what I've sent the, mm -hmm. I've sent Narina and Grant Thorpe, oh, yeah. I think you've got my email. I've got a receipt, but I still haven't heard. So what I'll do, I'll just read what I've sent and I'll, I'll just give mm -hmm. you like a rundown of what's been happening. Um, what happened was I contacted the Senior Development Advice Engineer, Mr Craig Pearce, and were asked to email both the Infrastructure Department and the CEO at Moreland Council. We have an ongoing issue that has so far taken almost two years and we wish to resolve it by both parties and hopefully come to some agreement. We have met all your terms and conditions to the best of our ability and would like to call a meeting if you think that would be the best way to go. Basically, we own the property at 8 Pleasant Street, North Fitzroy, started off by applying to build two townhouses side by side. One was going to be a little bit bigger and our family home. It was handed over to Donald Lassier, which was the urban planner at the time, and he inspected the property and was very happy with our design. We had no complaints whatsoever. We met all our neighbours, made sure that all their needs were met, no windows overlooking anything. So everyone was happy with what, what, what we'd come up with. It worked for everybody. Um, so when it was handed over to the next stage, it came to a halt by Stephen Williams. He said that he would not support the crossover on one of the homes as he believed it would determine the health of the tree. He felt a two-metre clearance was too close. After speaking to <laughs> council, we felt the best way was to apply for a road opening permit to give us the opportunity to investigate and see if any roots were in fact present and were going to pose a problem. In the meantime, I organised to see an inspections officer, Mr Harry Nadalkos, who came to our property and didn't see an issue with the crossover being installed. He provided me with a number of different types of crossovers he believed would work well and, in his opinion, he didn't think would be a problem. We were granted the road opening permit, organised traffic management, concrete cutter, hired an independent <coughs> arborist, Mr Graham Lewis, to dig up a trench two metres from the stem of the tree to determine if any roots would, be, would pose a threat to the tree. As per report attached, Graham dug up a 300 millimetre deep, deep wide strip at two metres from the tree and there were no roots exposed whatsoever. Now, I've got photos and reports of everything. Do you need to see that? Can I just pass that around just so you can get like an idea? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Now, he's actually made a mistake. It's two metres from the stem of the tree, not from the middle of the tree, and there's no roots at all. So if you just have a look at that. His conclusion was that a straight cross over two metres from the trunk would not compromise the health of the tree. Even after Graham's findings, we proposed installing a crossover. Even after all this was done, we said we'd put no fines concrete. So what that means is it dries to the strength of concrete but creates air pockets that allows water drainage into the ground. So if any roots were present, which they're not, um, the, um, it would supply and nourish the tree and nothing would be compromised. Again, no avail. We asked Stephen to please reconsider. He refused to listen. I've got an email trail, two years' worth, and the ARPRA's report, and were given other excuses, basically, that just didn't make any sense. From the crossover determining the half of the tree, and it became that the, that the tree would be too low, people won't be able to get into their cars. Well, it, just, it didn't make any sense to me. We bent over bank boards, complied, and tried our best to find answers for both parties, but it just wouldn't have a bar of it. 
After two weeks, we dug all that up. We sent the arborist report off. The gas company came along, digs in the exact same spot after we just concreted the whole thing, where the crossover was supposed to be installed in that same spot. So we've got just that trench. They did the whole area right to the end. And I just walked up to them. I asked them if they applied for a road opening permit. They said no. They said they needed to check pipes and they just dig wherever they think is necessary. I've got photos of the before and the after with the gas company as well. Sorry to interrupt, Ms. Um, Philippoulos. We're um, just conscious of time and I understand that there's yeah, a very fine. prolonged history as well and it's really yeah. important to know this history as well. Yeah. So if we could please ask you to wind up the question, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to ask the director as well okay. for a response. And, um, okay, well, I'll just skip that one then. And basically what's been happening is, cut a long story short, in the meantime, in the areas where I live, I've got prop photos of properties that have been given permits and they, they don't even have a one metre clearance to the crossover. Roots have been exposed, dug up and crossovers have been put in. Now, I followed, I followed two, three properties that have been granted from the start, from demolition stage, right through to the to the end. Now, I've got photos of that too. I don't know if that's something you want to see now. Thank you. We might um, ask for some information from the director as well. And I understand there's okay. a number of points of your question. Obviously, okay. the prolonged nature of it. And yep. um, I'm sorry for the very prolonged nature of what seems okay. like a very frustrating process. Okay. Um, but also, in terms of the consistencies of the decision making, I can hear there's a question regarding that. So I'm going to ask the director of infrastructure to provide an initial response. And we might come back to you if we need any further information. So we might just okay. hand over to the director if that's OK. And yeah. um, you're welcome to take a seat while he provides a response. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yes. Um, through the mayor, Helen, thanks for your question. As you've outlined, as I can see on the, the system here, there is a, a long history of comments. Um, and I suppose to be fair, some of the photos do look um, you know, fairly compelling in, in a case, but obviously a balance between street trees and urban heat island and other things. Um, I will take your question on notice and provide you a detailed response, um, just given the volume of correspondence that's occurred. Um, I need to give that uh, proper consideration before we provide the response. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Councillor Bolton has a question, then we'll come back to you. Well, I, mean, I actually think the you <coughs> raised at the beginning about the need for a meeting to try to resolve it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that sounds like yes. what's rather than further emails backwards and forwards sounds like yes. a solution. I think that's a very good idea, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Tapanos. Yeah. Can I can I probably request that perhaps a meeting does take place um, <laughs> with the CEO present as well, um, because. We don't want any residents to have to wait two years mm. to have a, a decision by council. Like, um, I don't think that is fair and people need to be able to get on with their lives and put and put issues, um, resolve issues within a, a timely manner. So I think that this one really, the resident deserves an answer. Mm. So perhaps um, a man for the resident, the CEO and the director would be the way to go. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. So we will um, arrange a meeting um, and we also will provide a formal written reply to your question so that, again, that's all tracked. Um, once again, apologies for the <coughs> prolonged nature of it. It sounds like there is a long history, but we'll make that a priority to have that meeting as soon as possible um, and to follow it up um, consistently. Much. But thank you very much for coming and raising that tonight. Thanks uh, the next question is from Mark Higginbotham regarding a letter to the Minister and follow-up regarding the car stacker. Yes. <sighs> Good evening, councillors. First of all, on behalf of the community, I would like to thank all of you for the work that you have done during your term of council. As an ex-mayor and councillor, I know the sacrifices that you have made and how much you have tried and endeavoured to do what you can for your community. And I thank you for the work that you have done. I've got two questions on the notice paper tonight. One relates to the question related to the Minister, dated the 16th of March, in relation to car stackers. My first question is, is whether, I, whether we've received a response from the Minister, and if you have, could you please, please outline the nature of that response, and also could I receive a copy of that response? Thank you very much for that question. Is that, you, that's one part of your question? It's one part. Okay. The other one relates to a completely different um, matter, but it is germane to council. Uh, so we have received a response from the Minister that's just been received literally within the last few days. I'll just outline the summary points that were given on my last director um, to expand on those. So the Minister is basically saying that um, amenity concerns can be addressed through planning permit conditions 
sufficient state guidance is provided through the EPA, um, the residential noise regulations, this is according to the minister, and a local, but also suggesting that a local policy could assist in decision making. Um, Council has put forward a position on car stackers at the panel hearing for C159 highlighting the issue um, and we're waiting the panel report so that's possibly an area that we can strengthen it but I might ask the director to expand on that as well but we have respond, received that, uh, that's the nature of the response that we've received. Fine, thank you. Thank you, through, uh, through the Mayor. Just to confirm, um, in terms of the local policy guidance, um, verbally we were also suggested that we actually develop a policy with other councils that are experiencing a high number of car stackers as well. Um, so similar to what council did with its ESD, <coughs> local, ESD local policy, um, that we would do that as a joint initiative with other councils that are seeking the same sorts of control. So depending on the outcome of the panel hearing on Amendment C159, which includes um, more provisions around design locations and guidance around buffers, um, if that's not successful, then we would need to consider with council whether it allocates resources to developing a more specific local policy. Fine. Thank you for that response. Just in passing, the chairman of the panel um, was made aware of the letter and of the various matters which related to the noise notes, the EP Act and all the rest of it, and was of the view that in fact all of those <laughs> were in fact in place and could be used for such a purpose. That was the view of the chair at the panel hearing. So I just make that as an aside. Mm. It's an important thing. And I'm sure that you'll hear further when the report comes in in relation to this matter. Mm. The second one, one relates to the question of rates. Councillors may not be aware that there is a major change taking place in pensions being paid from the 1st of January <coughs> next year in relation to the assets test. And this is going to have a fundamental impact upon rate uh, pensioner ratepayers in this community. Um, many of them, either on full pensions or part pensions, could well lose their pension payments altogether or have them substantially reduced. And this is obviously going to have a big impact on their capacity to pay rates. And I would suggest that Council needs to take into consideration these very factors in, in terms of whether you need to think in terms of another way of obtaining rates or some other method. So um, it's a question I'm asking, actually asking of council <coughs> whether they are in fact considering another method of dealing with the question of rates. Thank you, Mr Higginbotham. I might um, uh, furnish a response initially and I'm happy for other councillors to add to that. Um, just, I think it was at the last council meeting we discussed this um, regarding a general business item um, about getting some further information. It has been an, on the agenda of council um, for our whole time. On council we're very conscious of it. Every budget we set every year in terms of uh, rates and how much what, that, what impact that has, particularly on pensioners, given that the concession or subsidy <coughs> rates aren't keeping pace with uh, some of the rate increases people are seeing. And some of that is uh, speculative also because of property prices increasing. So you can have a minimal rate increase, which we had a relatively low rate increase this year, but we had property prices fluctuating quite significantly and some people faced much higher um, rates charges as a result. But that doesn't help them when, as you mentioned in your question, they might be income poor but asset rich. Uh, so it is something that I think all councils have to think about. It is something we're very, very mindful of every time we um, have deliberated on a budget. Uh, and I think councils are starting to think about how they work more cooperatively with each other, how we can find other sources of income, for example, to ensure that we are relying less on rates, um, particularly for those people who have uh, lesser access to other sources of income as well. Um, Councillor Tapados and Councillor yeah. uh, A very pressing issue. Um, um, Mark, thanks for, for raising it and um, I did move a council item calling for a report that I suspect the new council will receive at some point which would hopefully investigate all of those options and there's a lot of them. Some of them could be a big review and, and, and change of the, the system to make it based on taxation. Others could be very simple changes that will have a huge impact for, for, um, for pensioners and low-income earners. I was also reading the Local Government Act and noticed there's a section there on waivers. So if um, councils will know I've recently sent an email to see whether pensioners will be eligible um, for a waiver based on hardship grounds. Um, so this is an issue we must address, particularly in the South and municipality where property speculation is really driving up evaluations. Um, it's become now 
uh, an issue where a pensioner is potentially paying 30 and 40 per cent of their total income in council rates, and that is completely unacceptable. As a council, um, the two or two and a half percent we increase the budget by, um, that's the only real decision we make. Um, how rates, rate evaluations are calculated, whether <coughs> property speculation should be considered, um, that is the broader issue, which is really um, leading to very excessive rate increases. But as a council as well, in the rate capping environment, I think we need to do better. Um, we have a whole bunch of council assets that are not utilised to the most effective, um, in the most effective way to generate revenue for the council. So we need to be innovative and we need to use our resources more effectively. I know every time I go up to the Brunswick Town Hall, when I go upstairs, I see the vacant space that Methyl vacated, and I reckon it was three years ago. Now, we, why haven't we not been able to attract a community organisation that does pay some rental income <coughs> to actually move into that space? Um, so there's a whole range of council assets that are underutilised and we need to get a better return on them for the community. And as a council, we can't just rely on rates and grants. We need to have a look at what other mechanisms we have to generate income. And that's a reality. So we need to do that. Thank you, Councillor Tapnos. Uh, Councillor Hopper? Thank you. Look, I think it's such an important discussion, um, Mark, and we've certainly heard loud and clear over the last couple of weeks, I think, as we've been standing at the early voting booth and people are arriving to pay their rates, um, that this is hurting our community very badly. And the kind of assets test that you're describing um, is similar in a way to the way that we are measuring our rates, which is almost to penalise people for choosing to be long-term residents of our community. Um, we've had people who you know, are in their 60s or 70s and who moved to this community 30 or 40 years ago, having absolutely no way of predicting what property values would be into the future. And it's their forever home. They've built a forever home. And so for them, the idea of a property value having an interpretation of what they should be paying is just a completely inappropriate and irrelevant measurement to them. Their property value is not something that they're ever going to intend to capitalise upon because they want to live there forever and then pass it on to their family. So I do think we need to look at very different ways of measuring this. And we're seeing it across the municipality. I mean, certainly in the South Ward, um, that Councillor Ratnam Tapanos and myself represent, um, we're hearing it very loudly. And I think Brunswick is seeing the brunt of some of the largest property value prices. But even last week, I heard an example on Margaret Street in Oak Park, um, where I know that number 15 sold 10 years ago for $350,000. And now property two doors down went a couple of weeks ago for 1.1 million. So the increase in rates uh, in property values across this municipality um, is something that nobody who bought property is 10 or 20 or 30 years ago could ever have predicted. Um, and it's not a realistic measure on those people. Thank you, Councillor Hopper. Councillor Gillies, if you should add something. And oh, I just very quickly wanted to say um, that I'm not standing again, obviously, but um, if this isn't just a, que a question for council. I mean, they're cutting pensions uh, and, you know, we know who voted for that as well. But the point is that we should really be doing a very grassroots campaign to change the way this particular federal government um, and state government to um, uh, a certain... Um, um, for a certain mark, um, are treating our elderly. Uh, I think it's disgraceful in a society that is a, um, you know, we're supposed to be a first world nation and we're really attacking the people that have built our nation and we're attacking people that need our help the most. So I think that um, it's not just council. I think we should be doing a lot of things within our community um, to try and achieve major change for pensioners in this country. Thank you, Councillor Gillies. We'll now move on to our next question from uh, Ms Helen Deans regarding uh, a UPC decision and the Urquhart Street, Urquhart Street development. Thank you very much and um, thank you also for all the work that you've put in as well. I recall <coughs> that that's enormous. Um, I also, this is, I'm from the Pentridge Community Action Group and this is a follow-on from the last council. 
But I also wanted to thank Narelle Jennings from the planning department because she provided some fantastic information with um, all sorts of links to permits and things that had been provided already in the Pentridge area. And for those who are not familiar, there are numerous 18 and 19 storey buildings that are already um, in the planning. So we're fairly concerned about it. Anyway, um, my, my question relates to the planning. Um, there was a, an, a, a, an amendment, oh, sorry, Seven, uh, 11 Urquhart Street in Pentridge, in the Pentridge area, which is just up the hill from here, um, wanted to add an extra storey, remove a basement level of parking and replace one level of office space with an extra lot of one and two bedroom um, units apart from a few other things too. There was strong opposition on council in the urban planning, um, from the urban planning committee, um, particularly in relation to the fact that, it, they, that it's an activity centre and they want to c combine that work and lifestyle sort of combination so that people can work in the environment. So they were wanting particularly to provide the eight spaces. So. Um, I, I want to know um, uh, why um, I, I spoke to Philip Priest afterwards. For those people who are not aware, when we went to VCAT, it was not included in the statement of grounds and yet it was something that was considered so incredibly important by the Urban Planning Committee. And I really want to know what happened between the Urban Planning Committee and the writing of the statement of grounds, that that particular aspect was completely left out of the um, statement of grounds. And I did speak to Philip Priest after the meeting last time, and he said he thought it just wasn't an issue. So I'm not sure if that influenced, but um, the state planning minister, who I think was Matthew Guy at the time, did think it was an issue. He thought it was an important enough issue to double the number of spaces from four to eight. Future Estate or Coburg Quarter Barrister thought it was incredibly important when we were at the um, VCAT hearing and he, he was just bending over backwards to make sure that Moreland Barrister couldn't raise the issue in any way in the um, it wasn't included in our statement of grounds. And the councillors thought it was incredibly important as well. So I just want to know why... ...to ask um, the... in loss ratio, what sort of, um, sorry. Oh. I might provide a very, uh, please finish your question, I'll yeah. provide some All right, sorry. That, sorry. I'd also wouldn't mind knowing how, how, what's the cost in terms of our staff, just in terms of their appearance there and the cost of preparation. It, it, an enormous amount of work goes into them. There's also the cost of the barrister and there's the cost of every resident who attends as well. And we go, we are unpaid. So any of us who do um, put in time, uh, and that's another cost, but I don't want you to include that particularly, but the preparation cost, etc. And I'd like to know if, if this is a, you know, I assume that we lose quite a lot, sorry, just from what I've heard of various cases, and I assume most other councils do too, and I would like to sort of pursue it a little bit further than that too, because obviously if we're all losing these, if the people are losing these cases, surely there's um, some sort of imbalance in the um, regulations and we should perhaps start... Um, mobilising, perhaps organising with other councils to try and have some rules changed. So, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Just in regards to the um, part of the second question you asked about the VCAT 
hearing statistics. We did have a report that came to us, I believe it was the last council meeting, the September council meeting, with the with the um, uh, urban planning activity report, which has some of the statistics. I don't know, I'm not quite sure whether we had the full costing there. However, we will um, take that question on notice and provide that in writing to you if you're um, satisfied with that. And we can include um, that report as well in that. Um, in regards to the first question, I had a question of clarification um, as well about whether the matters that you raised were actually included as a clause in the um, planning decision made by the UPC um, because your question is about why it wasn't then translated to um, the statement that was presented to VCAT um, and I had a question too in regards to whether it was actually captured in the decision of the UPC in the final decision um, but I might move to, does any member of the UPC wish to answer that first uh, okay, Councillor Kavanagh? I, I don't want to answer it at the cost <coughs> About, the cost. <coughs> about the cost. Okay, so I'll go to Councillor Kavanagh first and we'll come back to the question about the You're right. 7 um, Quad Street. Uh, one of the things this council has been campaigning for a long time is on increasing planning fees and the like. Um, up until, well, on the, October the 13th, next Thursday, they will change for the first time in 16 years. The development industry has had 16 years without one increase that we can charge for planning fees. That's meant that in the last 12 months, the Moreland ratepayer has subsidised the development industry to the tune of $3 million. It costs us more than $3 million more than we receive in planning applications. So in other words, the ratepayer, every ratepayer, is subsidising the development industry. Right? Or usually for development they don't want. Right? Um, if you work, we have 60,000, um, uh, around 65,000 rateable properties. So every ratepayer is basically paying $50 towards the development industry. Right? That will change a little bit after October 13th. We'll go from having 30% um, return on the cost that we have to around 60% return. But we still want it to be uh, to get a dollar, a dollar return. It's just not fair. For development, they generally don't want. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Uh, Councillor Kavanagh, if you can be brief, please, yeah. for the uh, further question. I, I shall be brief. Um, look, it's often been disappointing as a councillor to see um, the work that the UPC does, the officers do, and the decisions of council overturned. Mm -hmm. Um, now, any planning authority, council included, um, must always make its planning decisions based on the planning grounds and merits. And certainly uh, our officers do, by, by in accordance with the laws, um, provide their recommendations without fear and favour to a committee, the Urban Planning Committee, which is an elected body, obviously. Now, that committee even though it's discouraged from taking community views into consideration, does listen to the community and does make some decisions. So there is an, a democratic element in the council decision-making processes. I don't believe that really exists at VCAT. You have professional VCAT chairs who make their decisions in accordance with the planning laws without fear and favour and without really listening to the amount of submissions that have been heard. Now, I know the state government has recently amended the BCAT laws to make community consultation and the sheer amount of community angst and submissions a factor to be considered at VCAT. I don't know how VCAT is actually implementing that change. I don't know how they're going to struggle with their, their then two duties of listening to the community whilst also making a decision based on planning grounds. It would be interesting to observe how they, how, they, how they grapple with that decision making. But I think it's a must. Just like we have a democratic system here, which is the elected officials, there must be a democratic way at VCAT where the community can be heard and taken serious and the amount of community angst can be taken into consideration. So we will, well, the new council will monitor that hopefully and certainly make strong representations and put, in, put together a campaign, hopefully, if they feel that VCAT is not taking community views into consideration, because from now on, they must. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. I might ask the Director of Economic uh, Planning and Economic Development for a response regarding the Cart Street, please. Certainly, through the Mayor. Just to clarify, in relation to the statements of grounds, they reflect exactly what the refusal grounds are. Um, yeah. So the notice of decision should have said something about the office space if that was going to be a grounds and included in the statement of grounds. Sorry, could you repeat that please? So in relation to the statement of grounds, they reflect what the notice of decision is or the refusal. Um, so that we can't add anything other than what council's decision is from the Urban Planning Committee. 
So the no, when we council refused the application, the grounds were specific on site, as I recall, um, but it didn't include anything about the office space. Um, I'm just, uh, Councillor Bolton wishes to add a statement as well. We are, I'm sorry, apologies, we are running out of time for question time, so we are, um, might have to take the discussion um, away from this chamber, it, following this it's chamber. It's just that I don't think that my question was answered. That was the primary objection that the councillors had from the ur urban planning group. Um, so that's, uh, the clarification why was... Why wasn't so that then... That sh I would if I could just uh, please yes. respond to that. Um, the, state, the notice of decision contains all the grounds um, on which council is refusing or approving a decision for or against an application, um, and that's quite specific. So I think the director is alluding to those grounds in the notice as councillors um, read it out on the night um, are translated then into the statement at VCAT. Councillors may have spoken to it, and a member of the Urban Planning Committee might want, wish to add something further. They may have spoken. At the last council meeting, I think maybe we need to go back to the actual urban planning committee that made that decision to reject and check exactly what it said, yeah. because um, certainly there was another resident who contacted me after the VCAT hearing to say that actually council needs to be much more careful about what it includes, because this um, aspect about the developer dropping the office space out of the development or reducing it. Um, just really limited the council's bar barrister in arguing the case uh, about the refusal. So um, I think maybe we need to go back and actually check exactly what it said um, because maybe <coughs> it's possible that maybe that was verbalised by the councillors on the night and, and maybe in council officer reports but might not have gone into the actual yeah, um, decision of the Urban Planning Committee, which might mean that therefore we need, as a council, to be much more careful about what we put in those decisions. So I think we'll have to do a bit of homework following on from this meeting. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. We've now got two questions from Mr David Nunns. Please come to the lectern. <coughs> Thank you very much. And I've had an earlier discussion with the CEO, so I'm more than happy for these questions to be placed on notice because they do have some complexity and some... Um, detail that needs to be uh, expanded upon uh, that we won't be able to do tonight. So my first question is, um, on notice, will the City of Moreland alter, amend or vary as appropriate Clause 8.5, Dispute and Grievance Resolution, and or Clause 8.6, Dispute Grievance Resolution, relating to final warning or notice to show cause, with the Moreland City Council Enterprise Agreement 2015, so that these clauses are compliant with the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act 2006, and in doing so, provide employees with the same right to appeal to an independent external third party that exists for a property developer. So I would like to provide a response, initial response, although we are taking them on notice. <coughs> um, so I will take the detail on notice. Um, our last EBA negotiation was actually last year, and there was actually an alteration to the um, clause that is relating to uh, final warnings um, and notices. Um, to show cause, in other words, basically the term, you know, leading into termination. And it actually does now include the capacity to take that to fair work. So that's shifted as of last year. But looking at the rest of the detail here, it would be great to have some time to work through and we'll provide a written response. Sure, I could respond to that, but I'll respond to that okay. sometime as after the 22nd of, of October. Thank you. And your second question, Mr. My Bell? second question, if I may, and thank you for the opportunity to ask these questions in the final uh, meeting of this particular council. Um, question is this, uh, given, and it's a little bit long to, and again, uh, question bonus, given that in the 2016-2017 financial year, the City of Moreland will remove the subsidy on waste services and as a consequence apply the full cost of the waste charge to ratepayers, will the City of Moreland give proper and genuine consideration to having waste services, i.e. waste collection done south of Bell Street, performed directly by employees of the City of Moreland, 
rather than the existing practice where a contractor provides this service with the sole purpose of making a profit from the City of Moreland and as a consequence its residents and ratepayers. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Nunes. I believe the CEO would like to make an initial comment, then Councillor Gillies. Um, so thank you. Again, um, I would love to be able to provide a written response because there's a, a lot more detail. So the only thing that I wanted to just put on the table is that there is a practice at Moreland that has been there for a period of time, oh, quite a long time, over a decade, where the north and the south of the city have been split down the Bell Street line. Um, and I think, as you pointed out, there's no signs to that line, but it is the line. Um, and that in the south, it has been provided by a contractor and in the north by in-house staff. And the intent has always been for there to be some comparison between the two. So whether everyone agrees with the reasoning, that's been the reasons in the past. Um, over the um, coming period, I think there is some work that will happen over um, models in the future. Uh, I'm not quite sure we're up to there, but it is, it is a decision before a new council at some future point. So I think there'll be a chance for council to consider its approach. Yeah, I think there's a clear Thank distinction you. between <coughs> a private operator seeking... Sorry, Mr Nunn, we won't get into um, debate at this time, but Councillor Gillies would like to add a further comment. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much for that question because I've harped on for four years about the fact that we should have in-house services. They cost less, contracting out, um, you, they never take responsibility, full responsibility. There's no, no care factor, and contracting out actually ends up costing more over time. Um, we've seen this with um, things that have happened, like um, you know, Pasco Borough Activity Centre upgrades, um, where you know the contractors uh, carry out the work and there's problems with the work and it has to be redone. It's fine. Um, because they have to redo it and they've signed a contract. But the point is, at the end of the day, if we had in-house crew that were able to carry out all these sort of tasks, they could be working every day of the year and getting things done, and, and there would be no concern about someone else making profit. Uh, and we would also, you would have to have the managers who actually, you know, could oversee it and take responsibility for what was going on. I applaud you for that because it's something that we should be doing and all councils should be doing because why would you give someone profit instead of actually using your um, rate money to the very best of its ability? Thank you. Councillor Bolton? Uh, just quick responses. Uh, the complaints I get about rubbish collection mostly would come from um, the southern side of Bell Street where there is the private operator. Um, not exclusively, but mostly, um, that's that's the case. Um, and I think the rubbish collection contract comes up next year or the year after, if I'm right. I think it's, you know, fairly soon. Um, and secondly, I would be absolutely shocked if the dispute resolution clauses for employees of Moreland Council are not compliant with the Human Rights um, Human Rights Act and. Um, I think that should absolutely be changed if that's the case. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. We now have to move on Thank to you. our next questions. Thank you very much for those questions. Our final question is from uh, Mr Nick Dolby. Thank you for giving me uh, opportunity to ask, I'm sorry, two questions. Uh, I've read the agenda. Um, more than City Council, correct me if I'm wrong, is one of the few councils that does allow question time, public question time, Can and I thank you. Moreland City Council for that. There is a report on homelessness in the agenda tonight. It is a good report. I commend it. However, I would like to make a request that Council and its officers consider uh, the leniency of using local laws against people who, through no fault of their own, are being forced to sleep, sleep on footpaths, sleep in parks, etc., etc. Sydney City Council, for instance, has reserved a park for people to set up tents in to sleep overnight. That's my first question. My second question is about this council, this council over the last four years. I'll use a federal analogy. Julia Gillard's government operated as a minority government. She had to negotiate with the Greens and other minor players and yet passed more legislation than any other government. Tony Abbott did not negotiate with other people and he passed very little legislation. I'd like to say that this council, you councillors present here in this chamber, 
have in fact been effective counsellors in having dialogue with each other. That you are Julia Gillard's rather than Tony Abbott's, to put it bluntly. <laughs> God, you said <laughs> I'd particularly like to commend the councillors who, for family and work reasons, are not uh, uh, seeking re-election. I'd particularly like to thank Lenka Thompson, Lita Gillies and Rob Thompson for the dialogue that they've had with all the others. Will you accept my thanks to this council? Thank you, Mr Goldie. Um, that's a very apt question to finish our question time this term on. Um, with regards to your first question regarding the homelessness uh, report, um, thank you for that feedback. And I note as well, one of the recommendations talks about a review of the local laws pertaining to this. So I think it's a very apt point and it's incorporated as part of one of the recommendations. Uh, but I think it is something we have to be increasingly mindful of. And this work actually signals that we are considering this very seriously and wanting to heighten our risk, um, increase our responsiveness uh, to people who are experiencing homelessness in our municipal municipality. Uh, in regards to your first point, I'm happy to take um, further comment from uh, councillors as well. Um, I concur that uh, I think this council has proven at a local government level, minority government can work very, very well. Um, I think the spirit of compromise and collaboration and cooperation has been born out of um, having very different views <coughs> across this chamber table. Uh, and I think we have achieved a lot. And I think you'll hear about that a little bit later on in the agenda, which when each councillor has the opportunity to speak um, on reflection of their four years on council. Uh, but there is a long list of achievements, a lot more work left to be done. But I think some of our best achievements have been born out of us uh, sitting down at the table, different views, often completely opposite views, uh, but looking for solutions, seeking cons consensus. And I think we found some terrific solutions as a result of all those different ideas around the table. So thank you very much for that feedback as well. Uh, are there any of the count other councillors that wish to add anything further? In that case, uh, we'll end question time at just past eight o'clock. Uh, we're now moving to, uh, we are moving to the presentation of officer reports and we're going to come back to reports by mayor and councillors following the presentation of officer reports. Uh, so we will now move to uh, DED 7916 policy neutral updates of the Brunswick and Coburg structure plans. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Yildiz. Is there a second mover? Councillor Davidson. Councillor Yildiz, do you wish to speak to this at all? Councillor Davidson? Um, just to say briefly that um, it's consolidating the various documents that inform C123 Coburg and also C134, um, and it's updating the structure plans. So it's a good piece of work that we're um, pushing forward. Thank you very much, Councillor Davidson. Are there any other councillors that wish to add any, um, any, add any comments or questions? Councillor Walton. I've got a small amendment. Um, to add a point seven to notify all people who made submissions on planning amendments C123 and C134 of these actions. And there's a seconder with Councillor Gillies. Councillor Bolton, do you wish to speak to this amendment? Um, yes, so I recognise that this is a policy neutral document which is designed to consolidate um, the document. Uh, and I understand in the report it sort of refers to the planning panel saying that the wealth of documents associated with these planning schemes makes it very difficult for developers. Um, and so I certainly appreciate the need for an amendment to consolidate the documents. But I think it would be, um, a, and that there doesn't need to be any extra public exhibition and so forth. So I totally accept all of that. But I think given the huge community interest in these two planning amendments, um, where a huge number of submissions, etc. I think it would be worthwhile if, for Council to um, notify um, the various submitters uh, of Council's plans about, um, you know, um, about these actions. So it should be a fairly simple sort Thank of... Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Gillies, do you wish anything further? Um, are there any questions or comments, Councillor? <clears throat> I think Councillor Hopper indicated oh, she wishes to speak sure. first, and then Councillor Davidson. I'm just rising to speak against the amendment, um, and I apologise for that, but um, it's not a small amendment. Um, many thousands of people contributed to the Brunswick Structure Plan and the Coburg Structure Plan, um, and so this amendment actually represents several thousand dollars worth of postage notifications um, on a proposal that um, is not transformative and doesn't 
in fact change the structure plans in any way um, that would be relevant to people who made submissions. It simply inserts them now that they've been given effect by the state government um, into our planning scheme. Um, I think it's a poor use of rate money um, to spend thousands of dollars notifying residents something that um, has no impact on the choices that they've made or the submissions that they've made to this process. Um, we speak often in this chamber uh, about the additional costs given to us um, as a result of development. Uh, Councillor mentioned it in fact earlier this meeting. Um, our planning team are under enormous um, resource for the gallery. our resources, not on Councillor Hopper, Councillor Davidson. Um, my my points will echo exactly what Councillor Hopper has said, that this information isn't something new that we're putting to the community for their input. It's already had their input. They've already contributed immensely to this. And my concern is also the cost that would be associated with postage. Um, but I would be voting against that amendment. Any further comment on this amendment? I'd like to add a brief statement as well. Um, I too share those concerns. I agree with the intent in terms of we should be as open and transparent and communicate with anybody who's um, participated in uh, structure plans particularly, given they're so significant. However, given it is policy neutral, um, in some ways we're making sort of editorial type administrative changes. Um, I don't understand the full uh, rationale behind it in terms of what a resident would then read from that letter to say we've made an administrative change to a policy document and we're notifying you. Um, I don't actually um, think it uh, bears the burden of the cost that's involved. And it is thousands, of, we've been informed it's thousands of letters. Any further comment or question? Do you wish to? Uh, yeah, you don't really have the right to close the debate. Is there any further point you want to add, Councillor Bolton? It's an amendment, so you don't really have a right to close the debate. Just a little comment. Um, my memory of the numbers of people who did submissions, so I'm not talking about some big public sort of thing, is that it was several hundred um, on so you know, it was something like 200 and something or 300 and something on the C123, and maybe it might have been more on. The Brunswick one. Can we get some clarity on um, so that? I don't time? think it was, I'm pretty sure it's not thousands, but j just given that, um, you know, we're trying to, you know, simplify things, developers want things more, more simplified. I also think, you know, residents often struggle to follow all of these documents and so forth. I think it is really. You know, I don't think it's thousands. I'm pretty sure. Councillor Bolton, thousands. before you proceed, I'm just going to ask for clarification yeah. on that because I think it um, goes to the substantive nature of your point, uh, Director. So, through the mayor, um, if it is only submitters and not everyone who was consulted, yeah, um, we would be talking more around 700 people. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the concern would be though that those people have been involved before and it's not changing anything, and they would become potentially confused about why they're receiving a letter around nothing that's changing. Um, that, would, that would be all our advice would be on that because we've consulted widely, for example, on the neighbourhood activity centres and got lots of concerned people ringing up, why are you consulting me? This doesn't have anything to do with me and I can't, I have no input. So it, it can be counterproductive. So that would, I'll just be mindful of that. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put the amendment now to the vote. So all those in favour um, of the amendment? All those against? I declare that lost. Now moving on to the substantive item. Any further comment on the substantive item? No, in that case, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Declare that carried. Thank you, councillors. Uh, we're now moving on to DED 8016, uh, review of the Public Resort Recreation and Land Fund. Um, I'd like to move that with an amendment, if that's okay, by <coughs> councillors. I've just circulated the, yeah, the amendment. I'd like to add a couple of additional resolutions, uh, and that is point three, to note that council will confirm the next airspace project when it makes its final consideration of its first airspace project, the Black Street Car Park, and a number of the priority sites provide, um, a number of the priority sites provide open space opportunities. Uh, and Point four is that council reaffirms its commitment to explore options for creating open space at the Edward Street car park in Brunswick and note that the Staley Street car park could also be explored as a future open space project. And if I have a seconder, I'm happy to speak to the report. Councillor Thompson. 
and hope stroke. Oh, you might ask no. that for an amendment. Um, I'll just speak to that um, briefly. So this is uh, a fantastic report. Um, continuing and progressing some work that we've started as this council in terms of looking at open space within our community. There have been a number, <laughs> this council has been concerned about the provision of open space in our municipality with some areas experiencing um, less than uh, less than ideal rates of open space, particularly in the south, um, and it has been a subject of a number of debates uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we have put our minds to doing some strategic work about how we can uh, create more open space, uh, and the reactive approach just hasn't been working as well. We've uh, got a very inflated property market. Um, the approach of council, to my understanding, has been that when parcels of land come up for sale, uh, we try to bid for them. That could be potential open space, but we are being outbid in this highly inflated market. Um, and we do have a responsibility to provide, I guess, cost-effective solutions, but also open space solutions. We want to provide more green open space for our community. So we've thought about how we can uh, strategically uh, create more open space. And that's also thinking about the areas that are really under um, resourced by uh, open space at the moment, and they just have a lack of open space. So this report uh, talks about the progress of that work, um, has a really interesting map in terms of some of the areas that are lacking access to open space, that's within the 400 metres um, of your home to be able to access open space, uh, and gives us a really clear plan about where we should be trying to create new open space and acquire spaces for open space. And the amendments that I've put forward are thinking about a couple of the cast, uh, parks that Council owns that we've been talking about airspace. Uh, rights that we could develop into perhaps social and affordable housing or open space. There's a lot of legal work um, and administrative work that's required to have the change of use and we've also got to provide those car spaces uh, for traders and the community. Uh, and we've got one project on the go which is the Black Street Car Park. Following the completion of that project we're seeking to learn lessons from that project, we will explore the other options. Um, and I just wanted Council to reaffirm its commitment to the Edward Street Car Park, which has been the subject of discussion with this Council, um, as well as a proposal around the Staley Street Car Park, and that is one area that is lacking um, open space currently. So that is a reason for the two extra amendments. Uh, Councillor Thompson, do you wish to speak to this Hi, report? Yes, thank you. I'd also commend this report, um, just highlighting its importance, and as Councillor Ratner was um, outlining, um, the great strategy that's uh, necessary to ensure that every person in the municipality has access to high quality open space. Uh, the map on page 173 I think gives a good visual representation of where we're actually deficient in open space and like on the whole it, it looks pretty good. There is open space available to many parts of our um, municipality but certainly there are pockets that we need to rectify. Um, so I commend also this um, the amendment because we've done some feasibility studies on our airspaces over car parks already that this council has endorsed. Um, and there is the, always a contention about the, tra the changing traffic movements and the future use of cars around our municipality. So therefore reassessing car park spaces and our off street car parks. So I, um, I want to recognise also that, there, that we have already done our feasibility on um, airspace for affordable housing but then also recognising that there is um, provision for open space as well in some of the areas. Maybe it's a combination of both over the same car park. So I certainly recommend and uh, commend this strategy moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Tapanos. Thank you. Um, I rise to seek two amendments. Mm -hmm. um, I believe one might be not very controversial, so I'll um, that one first. But um, if you have a look at the map... Um, Could you please outline the amendment? Oh, sorry. The amendment is to insert Hope Street car park. In the um, in two point four, I apologies. Just I'll just um, check for the resolution. Uh, so point four in that list uh, in point four. Yes, I'm okay. happy with that change. Secondary, are you happy with that change? Because that's incorporated as part of the substantive. Excellent. Can you please I'll outline the second amendment. Um, the second, uh, the second amendment is to remove. Um, so it's a point one where it says to note the review of the. Public Resort Recreation and Land Fund is underway to recommend a strategic approach to the allocation of funds across upgrades of existing open space, um, to remove the words across upgrade of existing open space and just leave the words proactive purchase and development of new open space. Okay, thank you. So that's an amendment on the floor to delete those words around the upgrade of existing open space. That's not satis uh, satisfactory to the mover or seconder. Um, so can, is there a seconder to that amendment? Does anyone need that amendment outlined again? Point of order. We can't be making the really possible argument and then issuing 
no, the uh, initial amendment was incorporated as part of the substantive because a mover and seconder were happy with it. We're now on the second amendment. Uh, is there a seconder to the second amendment? Can I clarify? Yes, Councillor Davidson. Is that to remove... Um, upgrades. Upgrades, the yes. word upgrades. Okay. From point four? Point one. 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 Upgrades of existing. So currently the first point reads that we will review the PRRLF uh, and recommend a strategic approach to the allocation of the fund across the upgrade of existing open space and proactive purchase um, and development of new open space. And Councillor Tapanos is to delete the words upgrade of existing open space. Is there a second of pardon? Actually, Paul, we can wait. It's not just that word. Yes, I just, so do you want to clarify it, Mayor? Yes, certainly. So just for, I'm being very particular because I want to make sure we get the words <laughs> absolutely right in these resolutions. So, um, so it currently says uh, the approach to allocation of the fund across upgrade of existing open space and proactive purchase, etc. What this would delete is the words upgrade of existing open yes, space. That's, yes, that's so what it's what not the word clarified. just upgrade. It's no. that whole phrase. Yes. Yes, and in right. effect, what it does is basically, um, yeah, so yeah, remove that. Yeah. That's clear. Um, is there a seconder to the amendment? Uh, there is no seconder to the amendment, so the amendment uh, lapses for want of a seconder. Um, do you wish Can to speak I, to I the substantive item? To yep. speak to the substantive. Um, firstly, I'm really pleased with the um, additional dot points that have been added. Um, I would even go further and say we can make, or well, perhaps not today, but this council should have made those decisions in regards to the future of Edward Street Car Park um, and some others in the municipality. Um, but I will also add that having a look at the map, and I think councillors will all agree, there is no darker shade on that map which says in need of open space, no darker shade. And there is no area in our city which is more densely developed than the Bree Street in Brunswick, in the Albion um, train station in that precinct. Um, it, it is the Anstey station. Thank you, councillor. Um, Nowhere in our city needs open space more than that precinct. So I'm really pleased that Hope Street, which is a significant council car park in size, is added as investigation because I think that should be a real priority. Um, I would like to speak a little bit in regards to um, this levy. For those in the gallery who don't know, the levy is collected on development on subdivisions. Um, it is a contribution that the development world is making to say, I am adding more dwellings to your municipality. I'm adding more people to your municipality. These people use your existing services and facilities. They use your open space, particularly with big apartment developments because they quite often don't provide open space. So we have more people using our parks and this contribution is there to expand those parks, to purchase more parks. And yes, I must remind the council this resolution is only an opinion to a review. It's not making the change tonight. Um, it was only a recommendation. And I believe many councils, particularly Moreland, has quite often spent money on upgrades, but not purchased new space. They have effectively cost shifted. They've taken money, normally there for upgrades, moved it to some other area and said the upgrades will now be done by the levy. And I think that's unfair. I think we need to fund those upgrades from rates money and keep the levy for what it was really there for, and that was to the creation of new open space. I don't doubt for a second that a space that is upgraded and enhanced is a great benefit to the community. What I'm saying is, let's do that. Let's do it with rates money. We've been doing that before this levy was introduced with rates money. Let's continue to do it with rates money and invest heavily in it. But let's really make those strategic purchases. Um, we had a report a few months ago. Um, Brunswick, I believe, the three suburbs, Brunswick East, Brunswick West and Brunswick, contributed something like $25 million um, to this levy. Yet we've seen very little, if any, Councillor Tappanos, space. your time has lapsed. Oh, sorry, Please yes. wind up. Yeah, um, we've seen very little, if any, open space purchased by it. So I'm looking forward to seeing what a future council may do in this space. But it's about time we started using the money to purchase new open space and add green open space, not just upgrade it. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. Is there any councillor who wishes to speak further? Councillor Hopper? Um, I wanted to seek a clarification, if it's OK. My best recollection is that council received and voted in favour of a report 
um, that stated that utilising the Edward Street car park mm -hmm. as an open space was not um, supported by office, like an officer recommendation. Am I incorrect in saying that? Or that, that is my best recollection, that we weren't supporting using Edward Street car park as an open space? Uh, through the mayor, no. It was actually just at the time highlighting that in terms of the costs to get the project up and running, it wasn't feasible at this time but recommended that that be revisited again. With the airspace project. So it didn't change from being open space, but it was just um, too many hurdles at this point. And okay. the reference in the uh, recommendations, the amendments I made as well, uh, referenced the airspace uh, feasibility work and the first yes. project. So one of the, I believe some of the text around that report was we need to learn the lessons and uh, get through the first project before we can prioritise the second and third project. But we still had a commitment to pursuing it, but we just needed uh, to wait for a little period till that first project was completed. Sure. Um, I'd just like to express my concern at us um, only choosing public car parks um, as potential future sites for open space. Um, and I've expressed this concern previously. Um, the nature of my concern is that although our off-street car parking in the Sydney Road precinct is currently underutilised, I think that we should be doing more to ensure that people do utilise that off-street car parking, um, which I believe is badly needed for shoppers. Ideally, I would like to see us progressing to a point where we can move some car parking off Sydney Road and encourage people instead to be using off-street car parks so that we can improve cycling amenity on Sydney Road. Um, I don't think we can do that by turning all of our off-street car parks into open space parks. Um, I definitely think we need to be finding opportunities for new open space in central Brunswick, um, but I'm not sure that turning our car parks into open space is the right way to go about it. Thank you, Councillor Hopper. Is there any other councillor that wishes to speak for or against this report? Uh, you've already spoken, Councillor Tapanos. All right, on that note, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. We're now moving on to DCS 5316, Assembly of Councillors record uh, for the 1st of August, to the 31st of August. Is there a councillor that wishes to move it? Councillor Kavanagh, is there a seconder? Councillor Robert Thompson, Councillor Kavanagh, do you wish to speak no, to it? Councillor Thompson, any questions or comments? No, in that case, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. We're now moving on to DCS 5416 financial management report for the period ended 31st of August 2016. Is there a councillor that wishes to move that report? Councillor Yildiz, is there a seconder? Councillor Rob Thompson, Councillor Yildiz, do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Thompson? No. Okay, any comment or question regarding the financial management report? Okay, case, so I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Next we've got DSD 2816 Bob Hawke Community Centre Development, Councillor Kavanagh. Um, do you wish to outline the report before we get a seconder? Or do you wish uh, to speak no, to it? Sorry, okay, is there a seconder? Councillor Hopper? Councillor Kavanagh, do you wish uh, to speak to, to it? Uh, just to thank the officers for bringing back this report. Mm -hmm. and it's a, uh, I think it's a very good recommendation. I think it, uh, and there's a confidential attachment too, which goes through the amount of meals, et cetera, that are delivered by Bob Hawke Community Centre. And uh, um, yeah, we can't predict the future, so I'm just saying thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Hopper? Um, I'll look just to really commend the work that continues to be done at the Bob Hawke Centre. Um, we're really proud to be one of very few councils that's still providing a hot to your door Meals on Wheels service on a daily basis. Um, I've had the pleasure of going on a Meals on Wheels run um, when I was Deputy Mayor, as I believe other councillors have done at various times. Um, and it's so much more than dropping off a meal. Um, there are a lot of councils now where it's just a freeze packed. Um, meals at the door and I think you know this report covers the fact that there are various other options out there for getting food pre-packaged at a cheap rate um, but our service isn't just about that it's actually about the human contact and for many people who receive Meals on Wheels um, it may be the only person that they see physically all day so it's just as much an opportunity to have a visitor and make sure that that person is doing okay um, as it is a hot meal to their door. Um, we've got a wonderful team down at the Bob Hawke Centre um, and so I'm sure that this review will show um, that we should continue to deliver this service and continue to build on it as well. Thank you Councillor Hopper. Are there any other comments from councillors? Councillor Tapnos. Yeah, um, I'm really pleased to see this one here tonight. Um, and it's it's been a long time coming a little bit and if I can if you allow me to sort of um, 
think back and reflect a little bit on the past. And, and uh, I shall do it within time limit. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and, and, and also to thank, I know um, McDowell, we did a, um, thank Councillor Teddy, and I will thank Councillor Teddy for this, though. Um, when I, we first got elected in 08, um, the decision to um, close the Bob Hawke Centre had been made. Um, we were moving to a regional food kitchen. Um, we were moving to Snap Chill, um, buy by the bulk, deliver to your door once a month or once a week or whatever it was. Um, staff had received their notice, they were finishing. Um, and Councillor Teddy raised this with me, and I was the mayor at the time, we went down to the Bob Hawke Centre, and we saw the good work that they did, and we spoke to staff, and we saw the quality of the meal that was delivered. Uh, we went on those runs, we spoke to residents, we saw the value, not just in the meal itself, but the social interaction. Um, we lobbied, we advocated, and we changed the view of the council. We changed the council decision and we kept that service. Now, at the time, we were a bit skeptical that perhaps TCI, Coburg Initiative, needed that space, needed that land, um, and why was this decision being made? Um, and we knew then that at some future point in time, we will need to invest um, in the Bob Hawke Centre. And it's really great to see now that we're doing that feasibility study and we're investing, it's another commitment to show that we value the service. It's another reaffirmation of the commitment we made to our residents to keep the service. Now we're saying we're not just keeping it, and we've made a subsequent one that we got out of the regional <coughs> food kitchen, but now we're expanding the centre. So it's a guarantee to our community that this service will continue to run into the future. We're investing in it not just keeping it, not just maintaining it, we're investing, and we're investing for growth. And I know why we're doing it, because we know that there is dissatisfaction out there in the community with the regional food kitchen. We know that our neighbours are probably going to start assessing our service and comparing it with what they get. And we know that kitchen will receive a lot of contracts and a lot of land in the future. And that's a great thing, and we all should be proud of that. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. I believe there's no other councillors who wish to speak to it, and Councillor Kavanagh wishes to add something further to close. Well, actually, the Councillor Tapanos has said what I was going to say. I was going to praise Councillor Teddy for his work on that in the early, early years. Um, it's it's uh, a couple of tiny things he said I disagree with, but he hasn't said I, I entirely agree with. And uh, uh, it was something that uh, he, he should be proud of. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. I'll put that report now to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Next, got DSD 2916 City Oval Ground Covers. I have an alternative recommendation to the one on yes, there. Could you please outline the amendments or the alternative recommendation? Uh, just to change uh, on the officer report to keep point one as it reads and to change point two to advise all turf wicket clubs in Moreland of the options available if they would like to purchase new turf wicket covers. And uh, Councillor Thompson is seconding that. Councillor Kavanagh, do you wish to speak to this item? Oh, just to say that um, my amendment uh, doesn't take away from advising the uh, um, City Oval, but I think while we're advising them, um, you know, I, I've been to many of the sports forums over a number of years, including the one recently for the summer sports, which includes the cricketers, obviously. And um, I don't think this has come up at the sports forum previously <coughs> that um, such uh, that sponsorship up to $5,000 is available from Bendigo Bank, for example. So I do think that all um, turf wicket clubs would be interested in uh, in hearing of the opportunities they have to, <coughs> to, to purchase wickets, uh, to turf, turf wicket covers, I should say, not wickets, to turf, um, and because it, it is an issue for all turf wicket clubs, and I think everywhere we have 14 turf wickets in the municipality. Thank you, Mr. Any further comments, questions? In that case, I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against, I declare that carried. Next, moving on to DSD uh, 3016 proposal for International Women's Day. Councillor Hopper. Um, I'd like to move it with an amendment to point two. Um, that point two now state, seek the $15,000 required through the reallocation via the mid-year <coughs> budget review process, but that <coughs> none of this come from existing gender equity initiatives based budget. You know, I have a seconder, I'll speak. Okay, Councillor. Uh, Bolton, Councillor Gilly, seconded. Uh, Councillor Hopper. Thank you. Um, this is a report that's come about 
as a result of a council item that I moved a couple of months ago um, in relation to the decision this year not to present a separate Honouring Women in Mullen Awards, but to incorporate the Honouring Women in Mullen Awards as part of our general awards ceremony. Um, I believe that having a standalone event to celebrate and honour International Women's Day um, is a really important thing. Um, and in fact, the number of nominations that we always receive for the Honouring Women in Mullen Award often far exceed the nominations that we receive for our general awards, uh, which is in contradiction to the fact that often women aren't nominated or don't nominate not nominate themselves for honours such as this. Um, so I do think that having these awards has been a really successful endeavour um, and it's always been a wonderful thing to go along with them and see all the women in our community who are doing very good things. Um, the reasoning for the amendment, um, currently the report states that the current budget to deliver on gender equity initiatives in our base budget is $6,000 for this financial year and that part of this can contribute to the cost of the event. Um, I would put it to my fellow councillors that $6,000 is an incredibly paltry sum to deliver gender equity initiatives in the first place, um, especially considering uh, the diversity of our municipality and all of the excellent work that we are undertaking as a council in relation to um, the Family Violence Royal Commission and our work in that space. Uh, and so to try and rob that very small budget already um, in order to um, assist these this awards, um, I think would be an unfair thing. Um, I think the money needs to be sourced elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rappel. Councillor Gillies, do you wish to add anything further? Are there any other comments or questions from councillors? No, in that case, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. We've next got DSD 3116, homelessness in Moreland. And Councillor Bolton, we've got an amendment I'd which like was circulated. With one very tiny amendment, yep. which is um, point one refers to convening a working group of key staff service organisations, including Vincent Care Victoria and people with a lived experience of homelessness, I'd like to insert and the Homeless Persons Union after Vincent Care Victoria. Okay. Um, is and there a keep the rest of yep. the um, rest of the resolution as is. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And Councillor Gillies has seconded that. So do you wish, do you wish to speak to it, Councillor yes, Bolton? Yes, I think, um, I mean, there's obviously a lot that needs to be done. Um, this report makes a very correct point that um, Homelessness is far greater than what we see um, or people we see living rough on the streets. And it's also a very complex problem, um, especially, you know, I mean, the lack of services, including lack of um, non judgmental detox services and, and support services like that can all contribute to issues of homelessness. Um, I, so I think this is just a very, very initial step. It needs to go a lot further. There obviously needs to be further investigation, but at least um, some of the figures and statistics are starting to come together. And I believe um, maybe when the report comes back to council, I think there also needs to be some sort of listing on the council's website about services that people can access when they're in distress. I mean, some people who've regularly access to services, know what services are available. But at the moment, what we're seeing in Melbourne, I imagine around Australia, is a lot of people who are totally new to being homeless. Um, I think there's a whole new layer of homeless people now that were not homeless 12 months ago or two years ago as a result of um, declining wages, casualisation of work, um, the fact that the basically welfare payments have been frozen for more than 20 years and it's simply not possible to survive on any of the welfare payments at the moment um, unless people have some massive savings behind them. So. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Gillies, do you wish to add anything? Um, I just very quickly will. Um, I'm not going to um, agree with everything you've said. I won't um, reiterate that. But what I will say is that we did have a chat uh, la at last meeting who got up and talked about, um, you know, crime in Coburg. And, you know, I think that th these steps, we are looking at creating, um, you know, better policy around safety nets for people who are vulnerable, but also um, which stops them being forced to, to you know, um, engage in other practices that may be more antisocial like crime because they can't eat and they have no roof over their heads and all of those sort of things. So it's all very entwined and we are doing good stuff. It'd be good to see you all do much more when you get up. 
Are there any other councillors that wish to add anything? Councillor Thompson. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd also like to echo the sentiments by Councillor Bolton and um, thank the officers for bringing this report together. It certainly highlights, like some of, as Councillor Bolton was saying, some of the unseen or unknown homeless people um, sleeping rough out there that is not on our radar. And it does, what this report showed to me as well also, that there are a lot of services out there that maybe, um, yeah, that they don't know about. So it would be good to actually to try and bring those services out into the public forum um, or into the public arena a lot more so that people know that those services are available. Um, just on recent readings, I've seen that um, Brisbane City, City Council does like a an expo for homeless people. So, and that's where there's a showcase of all um, all of the services that are available to them. The medical come in and and treat them. So it's like a just like we'd have the, Co the Coburg Carnival. We would have an expo for the homeless people and all the services that are available to them. So it, it just sort of opened my eyes up to some of the more creative ways that we can sort of touch or reach the homeless people and also to integrate them um, into sort of community life as well with everybody else. So I think it's one of those issues that really needs to be in the public um, arena a lot more. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. I might make a quick comment as well and concur with all the comments that have gone previously. Um, looking forward to the next tranche of this work and thanks to Councillor Bolton um, and Councillor Thompson on all their work on affordable housing that they've done, particularly over the last four years. Um, this is an issue we are talking a lot more about and I know there's been a number of media reports, particularly in the City of Melbourne, and the crisis of homelessness that we're seeing. And I think uh, sort of more generally to talk about what seems to be happening, I think we've got to talk about inequality and the um, growing gap between people who have access to affordable um, housing and those who haven't. And we're seeing more and more people who are just where the housing market, um, whether it's rental or purchase, is just out of reach and they don't have any um, affordable options anymore. Um, we've also got to look at the policy climate. And, uh, you know, I think there, there are rises in homelessness that are um, often a uh, reaction, they happen incidentally out of changes in the economy, for example, rises in inequality. Um, and I know working in the settlement sector with people seeking asylum over the last few years, there's also deliberate um, policy measures that are often um, introduced by state and federal governments that actually create uh, it create much more difficult conditions for people to be able to access housing. Um, and those types of punitive policies just add to the growing inequality and we've got then crises <coughs> before us. And I'm glad to see a council like Moreland, and I know there'll be other councils who have to pick up the pieces who are willing to address it and name it for what it is. Um, we've just had a, a property, we're looking at a property boom at the moment where we've got increasingly unaffordable prices. And I think with uh, a discussion about rates with an average 20% increase in home prices across Moreland, I think we have to ask ourselves what is happening to this country, what's happening with housing affordability, uh, and we need all levels of government to take action. Um, and I'm glad uh, that our council has been at the front line wanting to take um, a generous approach to this. Um, and it's something that we're going to have to tackle at all levels of government for decades to come. Are there any further comments from councillors regarding this item? Councillor Bolton, we should close it a bit. One final comment, just as we close. Um, one thing, um, while there are services which are referred to in the report, actually, there's not a, an abundance of serv homeless services. I think we need to make sure we're aware of that. There are a range of services. Some homeless people have ex who've been you know, um, experienced homelessness for a long time, are very aware of all of the services and some of the services can be scary, uh, which is why a lot of, some people sleep rough on the streets. Um, but also some of them have a religious base and for people who've maybe been abused <coughs> in religious institutions, that's problematic. So far too many of the services actually have a religious base. And then I have heard, but I need to verify this, that there's about to be a report coming down from the state government which will transfer further public housing to the so-called not-for-profit housing associations. Um, and basically what happens then is the rights that people have as public tenants will be far reduced under this so-called um, social housing sector. Um, so, you know, we've got to watch all of these various policy developments in terms of trying to help people because really we need public housing if we're going to seriously address this issue. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. I'll now put that report to the vote. All those in favour? All those against, I declare that carried. And our final report is DSD 3216, uh, the Millicent Progress Hall refurbishment. Is there a
councillor that wishes to move this, councillor Lenka Thompson. Is there a seconder, councillor Gillies? I'm not sure. Yeah. Councillor, yep, Councillor Gillies. Uh, okay, Councillor Bolton has seconded okay. it. Councillor Thompson, do you wish to speak to this? Yes, thank you. So this is the Mountain Progress Hall refurbishment report, um, and we're just noting that the, the EOI that went out expression of interest to get a partner to um, get partner with council in terms of um, refurbishing it and then activating it to bring it back to community use um, was unsuccessful and that um, we didn't get any bids for the for the EOI. Um, but I, and I'd just like to say that um, that's not the end of the process. There is still funds available um, in this council move that there was a Melanston Progress Hall fund that we allocated um, five, over $500,000 um, for a detailed design. So that's the next step, even though we didn't get a, the um, expression of interest come through. Council is still moving on to the next step of um, doing a detailed design design for the hall. So, I, and once again, I'd just like to thank the the great advocacy work that's happened in Milneston community over the past six or seven years. Um, certainly been a, a big, long fight and probably a bit of a confused fight, I think, as well. So. Um, certainly looking forward to this progressing into the next year. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Bolton? I would like to say something. I think it is um, good that this report is further progressing things. I think there is a bit of a lesson out of this report. And thank goodness we didn't rely on expressions of interest from organisations outside of Council because the initial um, resolution was reliant just on expressions of interest, hoping other organisations would step in and fund the whole project or a large part of the project. And yeah, no um, expressions of interest were received by the council. So I think it just means, uh, and I think we experienced the same thing with the Saxon Street site. So I think we just can't rely on private enterprise or other non-government organisations to simply um, come up with the money. Um, maybe in certain circumstances that they might be the appropriate organisations to assist. But I think um, I think it is good that there was uh, an amendment made to the budget that actually moved things along because without that, we would have, um, if we'd just been relying on the EOI process, we would have got to this point and there would have been no step forward for Merlinson Hall. So actually, um, uh, anyway, at least... Um, Things are still pointing in the right <coughs> direction and hopefully they'll keep pointing in the right direction until the hall is actually restored. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Tapanos. Another good report today just before this term ends. Um, where can I begin with Merlinston Hall? Uh, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. It doesn't surprise me there's no um, um, interested parties out there. I just want to correct, I agree entirely with Councillor Bolton, but just correct, there was interest in Saxon Street. There was a lot of interest. It was problematic in many regards, but mo a lot of things did occur, like Black Dot Gallery, um, and we investigated a lot of other options. But we knew that wasn't the case here. Um, I think everyone knew it. Um, the community certainly did. I think I declared it a year ago in this chamber. There would probably be no expressions of interest. You know, it is the end of a process. It is the end of the process of inaction on this. Um, it is the end of time wasting. It is the end of the ferments. It is the end of let's push this to a future budget. I have no doubt, in my view, that's what this EOI process was. It was a delaying tactic. Um, not surprised. But that is over. That process has ended. We're getting this done. Um, and that's really good. And I'm really pleased for the residents um, who have been campaigning for seven years. I know and I wish that it had been done originally in the budget. I know countless motions that I moved through the chamber, which were not successful, but I'm pleased that ultimately this council found the extra money through an additional sale, an opportunistic um, uh, approach, I guess, because that money was there and we're able to now move forward. Um, it is great to be closing these off and not having this issue carry forward to a new council. Um, <coughs> I hope that a new council will be able to grant approved designs and grant a tender contract and be able to open a new refurbished Merlinston Hall. Um, and I'm really pleased that we're doing that work now so they don't have to do it um, coming uh, in the new council. But just to reiterate that finally, finally, this point, this vote in the chamber is making the full commitment and saying 
that's it, we're done, we're moving forward, we're restoring it, and it's going to be opened. And that's great. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. Are there any further comments? Yes. Councillor Thompson. Um, this was never a stalling tactic. Um, this was, in fact, pushed by me the entire time was to go out to market and look for commercial partners to assist us in developing Mellonston Hall, or at least supporting Mellonston Hall. Uh, it does surprise me that not, well, it perhaps doesn't surprise me either, that not a single commercial mm. operator out there could see any foresight in the Mellonston Hall precinct or, or the building itself. Uh, it concerns me that when we went out there and said, after we went back to council a number of times and continued to fund, fund it and increase the actual funding from council's point of view, that even then we have had no expressions of interest to support this particular hall. And now all these wide-eyed councils here are getting excited about us, about to spend probably a million, two million. I have no idea where the amount of money is going to end on this weatherboard facility up in Merlistown, which whilst is fantastic for the community, may end up being an albatross around our, our neck because of no support by commercial operators or anybody for that matter. So whilst I'm excited that the community is going to have a, a facility up there and there were other options that we could have looked at. It will disappoint me greatly that if we end up spending the amount of millions of dollars that we end up doing on Merlinson and all we have is a very nice looking weatherboard hall that is not being utilised, it will be a little bit disappointing. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Gillies wishes to add something. I just very quickly want to um, say <coughs> that I think the big lesson that should be learnt out of Melliston Hall is, in fact, nothing to do with what Councillor Thompson said, but actually that we shouldn't allow the, our community's assets to fall into such, to such terrible state of disrepair. We are only minding it for the public, and we have to be aware of that at every step, every step of the way, and we need to really start looking at um, why these assets are being left to such a, a dilapidated state and do something about it so that long term future councils are not dealing with the same issues that we are. If I could um, add just a quick note, I'd just like to thank Councillor Linka Thompson and Councillor Sue Bolton, and particularly Councillor Thompson, uh, for finding the pathway forward in terms of this funding um, and the progress that we're making towards this restoration. There's a lot of work that goes um, into resolutions like this and getting to us to a stage um, of progress like this. Um, and there's a lot of behind the scenes work as well, doing investigations, looking for alternative um, funding pathways. And Councillor Thompson did that work that got it ready for this year's budget. So I'd like to congratulate her for her tireless advocacy and unwavering advocacy for this project, along with Councillor Bolton and a number of other councillors across this chamber actually who've done the work to find the pathway forward. Are there any further comments from councillors who haven't spoken? I put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Uh, we're now moving to general business items and then we'll do the reports um, section. I believe there were uh, general business items from Councillor Bolton. My hand are two. I thought they were going to be on screen, but anyway, they're not that complicated. I think I've just got to get them up. Uh, we could go to Councillor Kavanagh's first okay. wish. Yes, because I didn't actually print them sure. out because I thought uh, we'll they were going to be on the screen. Uh, yeah, okay, um, that's fine. fine. I'll just get them up probably. Uh, I move the Council resolve to write to the State Planning Minister, Richard Wynne, MP, thanking him for responding to Council's plea to increase planning application fees and including an annual CPI adjustment. This letter also needs to reiterate that Minister ensures that all future State Governments are held accountable to the Victoria Guide of Regulation, completing the requisite review by 2021. And if I have a second, I'll speak to it. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Tapanos, Councillor Kavanagh. Um, after 16 years without a fee structure review and with no indexation since 2010, finally planning fees will increase next Thursday on the 13th of October, 2016. This council has been at the force, forefront of lobbying for this publicly, as has the MAV, who have lobbied on behalf of local government as well. For council's uh, publicity, I thank Cheryl Balfour of the News Limited for extensive coverage in the Herald Sun. Also, I recognise Jeff Lake, the member of the Mayor of Monash, and Vince Fontana, the Mayor from Darabin, and the work of council officers for their advocacy. The amount by which the fees will increase will vary considerably depending on the application. An application for a unit development with a, of a cost of under a million dollars will rise from $815 to 
to $1,457. An application fee for a unit development between one and five million will increase from $1,153 to $3,212. These application fees, these applications, these two categories represent the largest uh, portion of developments within Moreland. That said, with, with looking at the benchmarking of the old and the new fees, we anticipate the proposed fees structure will now subsidise 60% of the costs of providing the statutory um, facility. Previously, it was 30%. Mm -hmm. While much of this difference can be attributed to maintaining equitable assets to the system, there are also some instances where fee models could and should go further. The department's uh, uh, close ongoing monitoring and evaluation of these fees by October 2021 is required by the Victorian Guide to Regulation and this must be undertaken. In a rate capping environment, it is critical that cost recovery is maximised or other local and government services, many of which are also set by state government regulations, will be compromised. So this is a good news story um, that we're we'll, going to be reducing the ratepayer burden for development that generally they don't want. Right? In the last 12 months, it's been over $3 million that the Moreland ratepayer has had to subsidise the development industry. And as I mentioned before, if you think that that's 60,000 rateable properties, that's $50 of every person's rate. $50 of the elderly uh, pensioner in parts of the municipality subsidising a develop rich developer next door who's building development they don't want. It's just been completely wrong, and I'm pleased <coughs> that this minister, the first in 16 years, is actually has actually taken some steps to do something about it, and I think we should congratulate him on it. Thank you, thank Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Tapanos. Uh, so thank you. Um, I rise to, to echo the sentiments of John Kavanagh, and actually to thank him for his advocacy um, on this issue. I have heard many, many, many speeches on UPC um, around <laughs> around the uh, the status reports about the cost of um, <coughs> planning to the community, um, and it's great to be able to to see tonight that um, those have been announced and it will be implemented and changed. Um, so thank you, John. Um, you've done a great job there advocating for that and making us all aware of, um, of, of how much it costs our community. Um, look, it's not every day I sort of speak around um, in favour of user pay systems, but this is certainly one of those cases where the user of the service should pay for it. Um, I would be happy. It's, it's welcomed. It's great, 60%. I would be happy if it was 100%. I would be happy if it was 100% subsidised because we are talking about developments. And if the development industry in Victoria and in Moreland was struggling, if we couldn't get projects up, then perhaps I wouldn't be making this statement. But considering it is booming, the state coffers are full of money, the state surplus is driven by planning development, uh, planning is taking off, they can afford, certainly afford, to pay 100% of what it costs the council to actually grant those permits, to assess their applications and grant those permits. So it really should be 100% in my view, but we will take 60%, it's a great start, and it means that there is a whole bunch of money <coughs> in the council budget that can now be put to other areas and reallocated in other areas. Um, and I think John, Councillor Cameron, so I made the point, why a residents residents who are struggling to pay their rates bill in Moreland <coughs> paying to actually get a development, which they don't want. Um, most of these developments are being opposed by our community. So your rates are paying to actually build um, big apartment dwellings or even you know multi-unit multi dwellings near your home, um, whilst the person who's doing the building and the builders are walking away with huge um, profits from their developments. So it doesn't make sense. It's great that there is um, some movement on this. If it's CPI'd, it would be even better so we don't get into this mess where we have to have huge increases because the lack of cpi these services. Um, so, so that's a positive change if the government accepts that one. And I hope to see one day that it is a fully, fully, fully cost recovery service that's paid by the user and that's the developer.
Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. Are there any other councillors that wish to make a further comment? Um, in that case, I'd just like to make a quick comment and thank Councillor Kavanagh as well on behalf of Council for his uh, strident advocacy on this issue. Um, it shows you the power of that advocacy, actually, um, and often it takes years to be able to get these issues on the agenda, but the time was right, we've been consistent with it, and your, um, the strength of your voice in this um, can't be uh, stated enough. So thank you very much uh, for all the work that you've done, and it's a really welcome announcement, and we'll continue until we get that 100% um, cost recovery um, in place for local government. So thank you, Councillor Kavanagh, and everyone involved. Um, so in that case, I'll put that motion to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. So we've got two items from Councillor Bolton. Okay. I have a <laughs> um, So the first is that Council receives a report updating councillors on actions being taken to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the two anti-conscription referendums in 1916 and 1917, and particularly the role of the Brunswick and Coburg communities. Is there a seconder to this item? Councillor Kavanagh, I believe, his hand up. Uh, Councillor Bolton. So this do? item is really just uh, to provide an update. Um, the council voted, I don't know, 12 months ago or beginning of this year, I can't remember, for a series of actions to take place. There's some actions which are, you know, are happening. Um, council did agree to, um, or did allocate um, or grant um, under the community grant program, a, a grant for, um, commissioning a song to be produced, um, which will be sung by Brunswick choirs outside Pentridge Prison, um, commemorating the incident where um, Adela Pankhurst was uh, in prison for her anti-conscription and anti-war activity, and a whole group of mainly women, I think, um, sang anti-war songs outside the prison. Um, so that was is some tangible support from council. There is, a, um, uh, I gather there is a um, speech being given by uh, Professor Michael Hamill Green on the actual anniversary of the first um, anti conscription uh, referendum on the 28th of October. And the local group, the Brunswick um, Coburg Anti Conscription Commemoration Committee, a bit of a mouthful, has done fundraising and will soon um, be plastering posters around the municipality to um, their original anti war posters. Um, but there is a little bit of confusion about what's happening with some of the other things, um, items which the council voted on. So it's really just calling for an update. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, Councillor Kavanagh, do you wish to add anything further? No worries. Are there any further comments? Yeah, I Councillor Tappers? Um, yeah, look, it's great to see that work sort of occurring and, and the commemoration of the anniversary this, um, uh, this year. One of the key things was putting up some plaques at Pentridge um, and various other parts in the municipality. Um, so it would be great to get that status update because I think some of these things have been forgotten. But the key thing for me, um, which I know hasn't occurred, is actually making a more permanent um, a reminder of this and particularly one of the champions of the anti-conscription campaign, at least in the First World War. We won't speak about his time in Prime Ministership, but at least to sort of move on that recognition of John Curtin and his campaign in Brunswick at Trades Hall, in the trade union movement, to actually defeat the conscription referendum of 1916. Um, and it would have been great, and we proposed that as part of these celebrations, to have the new Wilson Street Place, park, um, that space that we built there, to be named John Curtin Place. And I'm really disappointed that that hasn't happened. And I really, really hope that we can make this a reality at least by the end of the year, if not early next year. I know there might be some small technicalities, but find we need to find a way to need to get it done. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. Any further comment or question? No, in that case, I'll put that item to the vote. All those in favour? <coughs> All those against? I declare that carried. And your final item, Councillor Bolton. So my second one is that Council receives a report on pedestrian and cyclist safety at the T intersections on the upfield shared path, including clarification on whether cyclists or pedestrians have right of way and line markings which clearly indicate who has right of way at these in T intersections. Is there a seconder to this item? Councillor Thompson, Councillor Bolton. Okay, um, this item really arose out of a discussion at my Faulkner residence meeting in um, September, or no, August actually, um, where a resident came along and has been um, having some intermittent email discussion with me over um, 
12 T intersections on the upfield shared path, where there are now new white dashed lines on the path, which he interprets as indicating that um, people entering the bike path have um, right of way over cyclists going along the bike path. Whereas he said it is it is inconsistent along the path, whereas um, down around the Park Street um, area, it's um, quite clear that um, the bike path has priority. And, and he also quotes um, some of the road rules where it's quite clear that road rule 73 um, 2 um, says that giving way at a T intersection, the shared path is a continuing traffic and the obligation to give way is on the traffic entering the continuing flow of traffic. Um, so what this resident is arguing is that um, things are quite confusing and a bit contradictory. Um, and I think, um, you know, often usually when there's one or a small number of people who find things a bit confusing and contradictory, that will be the case for other people. And I, I, I think, you know, often it is true that for a lot of pedestrians don't necessarily, if there's no one immediately coming along a path, on the, you know, cyclists coming along the path, pedestrians will often walk out if they're not really used to the fact that really mm. upfield bike path is really a highway in reality, a bike highway, um, and they don't realise the impending danger because there's a lot of blind corners you can't see around on the upfield bike path. So it's very easy for an elderly person to step onto the path in front of, you know, um, the cyclist who's racing to work or, or whatever. So anyway, I just think um, this sounds like um, something where council has tried to address some safety issues with some new line markings, but it might have missed the mark. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to call for um, a report to come back to council on Thank this. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Thompson, wish you add anything? Thanks. I support this report coming to council and um, understanding completely what Councillor Bolton is saying. I mean, it's not the first time that we've had to realign some markings um, on, the, on the bike path because other cyclists um, haven't understood the correct right of way. So I think to do an assessment on some of the t on, on the T intersections is uh, should be a welcomed one. Will be a welcomed one. And just to note that you know that field line, it's a it's um, up your path. It's a shared path. So it's cyclists, it's prams, it's pedestrians, and it's wheelbarrows. So there's a whole heap <laughs> of things going on in that park on that line. So um, yeah, definitely need to in order to make sure that the signage that we put in the public really speaks to what we we're intending. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Any further comment or question? In that case, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Uh, we're now moving to the final section in the open section of the agenda, which is reports by Mayor and Councillors. Uh, do Councillors wish for a three-minute adjournment prior to beginning that section? No. No? Yes. Happy to proceed? Okay, that's a straw poll. I think people want to keep continuing, so we'll proceed. Um, so I'm happy to take, uh, start with any Councillor who wishes to speak. Any councillor wish to speak first? Before the replies, yep. can I make an acknowledgement of some award winners? Certainly. Or oh, nominees? Yep. Uh, just, uh, just in the last, I uh, just want to congratulate uh, three councillors on particular achievements over the, since the last council meeting. Uh, councillor Legger Thompson has been awarded a scholarship to complete a PhD in the role of um, local government in supporting affordable housing. So I uh, congratulate you, Councillor Thompson, oh, on that. Well. And, uh, Uh, last week, Councillor Tapanos uh, graduated as a Master of History, <laughs> which is a great achievement when you're uh, working full time and you also council work and to achieve such a, a high recommendation uh, doing that. So, outstanding work, Councillor um, Tapanos, and congratulations. Yeah. And this Friday, uh, Friday, our Mayor um, is uh, being nominated by uh, Serendip Multicultural Awards. She's finalist for the most inspiring woman category. So wish you well on Friday for that. So there's three counts. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Uh, is there any councillor who wishes to uh, present a report or speak first? Yeah. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I'd uh, just like to acknowledge that this is our last council meeting um, for this term. And um, I guess I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that throughout these whole four years that we've been meeting on the lands of the Wandering people of the Kulin Nation, certainly pay my respect to the elders past, present and future. Um, and 
understand that they've looked after this land for 40,000 years or more and um, hope that it, as we inhabit the land into the future that we draw on that wisdom and that spirit. Um, being a councillor has certainly opened, opened my eyes to many things and I'd like to thank the community and the community groups um, and the organisations who fill you with a lot of um, exposure to what they're doing and how they're contributing to the community, how you can help them uh, navigate this vast thing or this vast business um, as, local, as local government. Um, especially like to thank the council officers and the executive for helping us through the past four years, or well, for me it's five years. Um, and also, also to my councillor colleagues, I think it's, um, it's been a very, uh, I guess a, a special, um, a special council in that it's uh, a very diverse philosophical backgrounds and I think that um, has been a strength um, for us and it's been a challenging strength. And I think um, the fact that we've gotten through and as has been noted tonight, um, there is, yeah, that strength in diversity and more than one community proudly diverse, I guess it's represented here in this particular room. Um, and I, I look forward to the new council coming in. This, the role as councillor is very unique and um, like I've been in Wallen for pretty much all half my life and I've never known the community as much as I have since being part of a council, um, being in this council role. Um, it gives you a breadth and depth that um, I never thought possible outside of this role and it gives you a whole, ho a whole heap of um, skills to take with you in other parts of your life. And I think, um, thank you Councillor Kavanagh for recognising my PhD award because that has come out of my term on council. I've found a new interest in affordable housing and how local government can assist with that and I think, um, yeah, so moving into my next chapter that will certainly be uh, where I'll be going. And I guess also from my term I see sort of some mayoral bookends that I like to reflect on. When I came into the council it was the last year of the previous term and we had Councillor Kavanagh as mayor so it was I think the first independent mayor for Moreland. And now that I'm leaving, we have the first Greens Mayor of Moreland. So I appreciate, you know, that that reflection on my term of council. And in terms of um, some of the projects that I've been particularly proud of and look forward to seeing them go into the future has been the divestment strategy. Uh, that's a significant piece of work, I think, was transformative in the local government sector. And that's um, something that will be covered in the new term. So seeing... Uh, the longevity or the the trans the next step in that particular strategy I think will be very exciting for Moreland and for the local governments in Victoria and Australia. Um, the affordable housing strategy, we've we've created a new entity um, that will hopefully look at you know how we can provide for affordable housing for our most vulnerable people and the municipality. So I think that's a really strong and um, big step for local government. And certainly commend um, the CEO in a visioning of that, just to give it a go. I think we're her words, just to give the pilot a go and see how we how we um, traverse the the unknown land. So I think that kind of leadership is really important for the councillor group um, and being councillor responsible for environment, the movement that we make towards urban heat island effect and the urban forest. So I'm really excited to see how we get our um, street trees be you know, um, grown or installed to survive and thrive so that we can see a net increase of street trees to 5,000. Um, and also, as we've touched on with the report earlier today, is the, um, the Melliston Progress Hall, like there's significant next steps for that particular program. So um, great work to the councillors around the table and to the executive and to all the officers out there as well. It's been I've um, very much appreciated the people that I've had to work with um, in the councillor group, uh, in the council group, and certainly wish yeah the new council all the best. In the Thank you very much, Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Councillor Thompson um, isn't standing for the next election, so on behalf of this council, we want to thank you for your tireless work um, for the community, um, for this council, and um, your legacy will continue in so many projects, and congratulations on your scholarship award. There's no better person to continue that work. <laughs> um, is there a councillor who wishes to speak next?
Oh, everyone's shy tonight. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Gillies. Because I'm not standing again. I'm just going to say, and I really appreciate uh, the Mayor not saying anything after I've spoken, if that's all right. Um, I basically really did appreciate the experience of being on council and it probably taught me a lot about myself. I had a pretty um, difficult, personally, um, four years in that I had a stalker who breached an intervention order, then I, my relationship broke down and um, I was made redundant and I'm in a completely new role. And it has made it incredibly challenging for me to um, eat, attend meetings and not fall asleep most of the time, to be honest with you, because I start at four, I get up at 4.30am every morning. Um, but I learned a lot about myself and I learned that I am not a bureaucrat and I learned also that uh, the changes to the, the Local Government Act that are um, being looked at at the moment are really pushing for people that are more have bureaucratic tendencies, I think, more than anything else. That's what they're encouraging. And I think that's going to be a great shame because just as I was criticised because I couldn't, you know, use my mobile phone when mm -hmm. others could because they couldn't understand that situation, um, there are other people that are in blue-collar roles that will um, – that that should be around the table and can contribute an enormous amount because they actually understand how a lot of the things that we hype, um, you know, hypothesise about and, and you know, we, we talk about in policy actually understand how it's going to, um, you know, um, in practical terms how that is going to affect people. Um, anyway, I'm not a bureaucrat but I'm certainly a troublemaker and you will see me around the traps and I will be... Um, helping grassroots organisations and probably annoying people around this table. Um, and it will be in a good way. Um, and I look forward to that and that will be the next chapter and it will be something that I'm in control of, so um, in terms of my time and energy. So thank you for that. You've taught me a lot about myself and um, I'm looking forward to retirement, baby. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Gillies. Can I, um, can I just thank uh, Lita Gillies in particular for her four years. I also want to thank you, Lenka. Um, I want to thank you, Robin. I I was a bit shocked that to find out that you weren't re-nominating because I have enjoyed working with you. We've had our ups and downs, no doubt, but um, certainly one of the most ethical, certainly one of the most easygoing, and certainly someone who says it how it is. So I really genuinely um, think... It's been a waste for us not to have you be um, not to have you renominate. Um, I want to thank our CEO, in particular, um, coming in and picking up the reins and trying to adjust very quickly to the position. Um, and also, you've been extremely, um, I guess, uh, reflective of, of the the values that this council um, was able to establish initially. Um, to the fantastic directors, to the officers, um, to the managers, but in particular to those guys who are out there in all conditions. I remember this morning seeing a number of officers um, uh, in, in trucks going up and down Sydney Road and just seeing the fact that they're working all hours trying to collect, you know, trees, fallen trees to, to you know, bins that have gone yeah. three kilometres down the road. Um, I want to thank the residents. I'm only here because of them. So... They've provided me with the opportunity to be here and I've tried to represent them to the best of my ability. Um, no doubt there's been some excellent projects we've been able to accomplish. Um, I think there's certainly some inefficiencies and we've been able to, I think, identify those and there's much more there that need to be, I think, addressed. Um, but in, in closing, it's taught me a lot. The last four years has taught me a lot about um, people. It's taught me a lot about the fact that you can't control people if you can just control yourself. Um, I think is probably one of the most important things. And and um, and I want to thank those who, who have given me the opportunity to serve this this council as mayor. Um, no doubt there's many, many items and many things that I think I've been able to influence, um, but it's only been because of the support of the team around me here. And I want to thank those councillors that do know me really well. I want to thank them for, uh, for, for their confidence and faith in in allowing me to serve with them. So on that note, um, thank you guys. And, and if I do get re-elected, mm -hmm. nothing will change. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. <laughs> Councillor Rob Thompson. Um, thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. And thank you, uh, Councillor Yildiz, for those kind words. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm, I like 
Councillor Thompson and Councillor Gillies won't be running uh, again um, for a number of reasons, mostly that I'm moving out of the, the municipality, which will probably be a good, a good thing, particularly to the officers. <laughs> <laughs> um, mostly I'd like to thank the officers and the, and the CEO for the support um, and their teams. Um, the, the council runs uh, very efficiently because of uh, the facilities and the services we have at our disposal. Um, and to be honest, you know, more, more times out than not, uh, this council will run very well with the, uh, with the officers and the CEO at the helm without us putting our penneth worth in. But we do represent the views of the community and those views are, are attempted to be given. Uh, whether that is right or wrong, uh, that is how it is done and uh, I think it's done reasonably well. Um, I've enjoyed being on such a diverse council as you find in front of you here uh, from all corners of the political sphere um, that has made it one of the most difficult and trying components, but one of the most interesting and enjoyable components uh, and has, like Councillor Yudley's, opened my eyes to, to some aspects that I would not have even considered. And I think uh, people like Tom Elliott and others need to come and listen and find out exactly what councils do on a day-to-day -day basis because I think he would be very, very surprised. Um, I thank the community, uh, in particular, the wise men that are sitting over there who seem to attend more often than not. Um, it's enjoyable having, having uh, uh, members of the public who are nearly as interested in, in local government as, uh, as myself and this group of people. Um, and uh, I'm grateful that they continue to come and continue to give their, their points of view and, and, I, and I enjoy listening to them. Uh, to the raft of, uh, of Greens that may be sitting over there looking forward to a, a position at this table. I wish you luck um, and uh, I can assure you that uh, whilst you see us here for five minutes of an evening before you toddle off to your you know, beds and enjoy your next week, um, this is a very small portion of what we do. Um, and I'd like to thank the gentleman at the back, but more importantly my wife, um, <laughs> our partners uh, who have uh, supported us as councillors. Um, my wife is once again at home looking after the kids. Um, she's never attended a council meeting. Uh, she's obviously watched us on, on the, uh, the TV many times, but has never been able to make it. Um, she looks forward to one and one only function each year, and that's the mayoral dinner, and she'll be here with us next, next week to say goodbye as well. Um, but she has given me far more support than, uh, than most people are allowed to. Um, you know, you can have hobbies, you can have uh, part-time jobs, you can... You, know, you can even have sporting pursuits, but to have a, uh, a passion that is local government or, or, or politics um, is something that my wife just cannot believe and does not understand, and I don't think she will. <laughs> um, and that is disappointing, but at the same time, refreshing in that I don't have to go home of an evening and discuss that at length. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I thank everybody. I thank everyone for, your, for taking your time to, to listen to me. Uh, mostly, I thank uh, the councillors sitting around here, uh, a, group of, a group of individuals that I've enjoyed working with, um, particularly the ones sitting here. This one I've never met. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and some of you more so than others, but uh, I've enjoyed working with all of you. Thank you very much, Councillor Thompson. I'll speak a bit more when I speak fully. Councillor Deponos? <laughs> Thank you, councillors. Um, uh, firstly, um, i like to um, begin by acknowledging an arena. Um, as the CEO and um, all of the staff at Moreland City Council, from Marina to the directors and managers, right through to um, the people who collect our waste bins, the, the lifeguards who sit at our pools, um, the casual staff who, who come in to um, be the lollipop um, ladies and lollipop men who um, help the school crossing. Um, we sit here around this chamber and we make decisions and we think we are, are changing things um, but it is really the people on the ground in the workforce that are changing things. Um, and that needs to be um, always remembered. Um, but nonetheless, the system works when the community has a say and the community has its say via its elected officials. And uh, we'll sit here around this table representing um, the community. Not sections of the community, not even our wards but the community as a whole. Um, and that is always important to remember. And in our decision making, we always keep the community's wellbeing and the community interests at heart. And I can say that for all 11 councillors. Um, 
but I, I wanted to acknowledge the work, particularly of, of those councillors who are not seeking re-election. Um, and it's great to be able to hear three of them um, speak tonight about their achievements and their contributions, their reflections and their perceptions of local government. Um, we all come to local government um, sometimes with different expectations, with different perceptions, and it certainly does shape us. Um, we learn how to deal as a team, and we are a team. In local government, there's no government and opposition. There's no I, there is just we, and there is a team. And if you want to deliver, you really need to work as a team. And I think that is what we mostly get out of um, our time on council. We learn that. We learn to struggle with different personalities. We learn to struggle with different opinions. Um, and we learn to work as a team. And I believe in the end, we all have different opinions. We represent politics from the left to the right. Um, but in the middle, good decisions are made. And this council over the last four years has made some very good decisions. And, um, and I'm not gonna mention them because I don't wanna go into all of our achievements, particularly as a councillor who is seeking re-election. Um, I think there would be a time to do that, um, possibly um, in, the, in the weeks following the, the council campaign, when we're no longer councillors and we have a week um, before the new council is sworn in. But I did want to say well done and congratulations to those who are retiring. Um, I can like to wish everyone luck um, in their council re-election campaigns or for the candidates in the chamber or for those watching at home um, for your re-election campaign. Um, being involved in local government is very rewarding. It is, if you put the time in and you put the energy in, <laughs> you will get the rewards. Do not expect a lot of thank yous from the community because you tend to only deal with those who have a gripe about council and you tend to listen to the 1% which is dissatisfied, um, but know that the large bulk of the community is reliant on local government, is reliant on the services we provide, and is more often than not very pleased um, with what Moreland City Council does. Um, so well done and congratulations to all around this chamber. Um, I think it's been a great four years. Um, every four years, every term is different. It has its challenges, but we've certainly done our best to deliver for the community and uh, I think we should be proud of that. Um, congratulations, um, good luck to all those re-standing. Um, it would be great to see what the community comes up with in the new term, not just what candidates they select, but what are those council, what are those election promises and what new ideas are brought into this <coughs> chamber. Um, whether I'm sitting here or in the gallery or at home watching on TV, um, I, um, I, I would always be involved in my local community and I would always be an active participant and I hope every resident listening to this shares those views and can act upon that because our councillors also need the community to have its voice and have a say and keep us accountable to you for what we do in this chamber. And I think that's when that happens, the system works best. But thank you, I've enjoyed the four years and, um, and good luck and congratulations to everyone. Thank you, Councillor Kepnos. Thank you, Councillor Kepnos. Um, Councillor Kepner or yep, Councillor Kepner. Yeah, 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 oh, no, 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 keep going. Um, look, I, um, first of all, I'd like to thank the officers too. Um, mm -hmm. I know, uh, I hope they know that they have my support, but I think tonight is generally about the people around the table, to be honest, and so I'm going to focus on that more, more so. Um, and I, you know, I'll just mention a couple of people and a couple of things about them, and I won't mention everybody, and I apologise for that in advance. Uh, firstly, to Lenka, uh, um, Tom, sorry, Councillor Lenka Thompson. Um, wow, what an enormous five years you've had. Um, you know, you brought passion around this table. You brought a friendly smile, but within that, a deep, um, a deep ability to uh, to get through your points and what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't be confused as uh, just a, a lovely smile, which it is, but it's more than that. You bring a wealth of knowledge. You bring a deep intellect. And above all, you bring a desire to want to improve the lives of other people. My maternal grandmother, who had a great influence on me, used to always say, you're born with two hands, one to look after yourself and one to look after others. And I think you articulate that better than anyone I've met in, mm. in this table. So I congratulate you on that, Lenka. To Rob, um, Councillor Rob Thompson, I thank you for your commitment. 
and I know that in the last 12 months it's involved a lot of travelling to Geelong, to Ocean Road, <coughs> to the back, but you've never used that as an excuse. You've always you've kept up your, uh, your attendance. You've always uh, contributed, and particularly thanks for your financial acumen and what you brought to the council in those four years, and also to your children's services work as well. You should be very proud of that. To Councillor Bolton, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for, uh, obviously we've been on different sides on many things, but uh, I do think that you speak for those that don't, uh, would otherwise not have a voice, and I congratulate you. And even though we disagree on many things, I've never questioned your, questioned your motivations. I think you're a highly motivated person and highly principled person, and I congratulate you on that. To Councillor Tapnos, I thank you very much indeed. Uh, you have always been very fair to me. We've always had a few uh, verbal, verbal stouses, but they've always been in uh, good nature. And you're actually the one councillor that often says something I think, I wish I said that. I wish I said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I congratulate you on that. Uh, to Councillor Davidson, uh, it's been a delight to serve with you for the last four years. Um, first got to know you and your lovely mother at the early voting centre four years ago. And uh, you know, my admiration for you has just continued to grow and grow. You've become uh, an extremely capable, passionate councillor, and it would, you've always had the integrity and courage, but you've coupled that now with confidence in the chamber and, and an understanding of issues and a, a, a deep resilience, and also an intuitiveness to understand the personalities of the people around the council table, and I congratulate you on that. And finally, finally to the Mayor, I congratulate you on particularly the last 12 months, but also the first three years. Uh, you know, he's probably not supposed to say best, but I think you've been the best mayor in the time that I've been on council. And I, I congratulate you on you know, your charm, your ability, your charisma, and your inclusiveness in the role. You're a person that's always at any function has involved other people to speak and allowed them to speak and to have their say. And you realise that in fact, uh, it makes us stronger when you, you involve the collective around the table and you've done that very well. Um, um, I look forward to congratulating you more next Thursday over a glass of red um, to say well done on your term. But I am deeply appreciative of the, the way in which you have handled the role and it's obviously a difficult role coming up to an election, etc. But you've handled it with charm and with grace and with intelligence and I congratulate you on that. So I thank you everyone for their treatment of me in the last four years. I obviously thank uh, the people of the North West Ward. For those who are hoping to be in this position, I can tell you that it is a privilege. It is a privilege. And, you know, I remember seeing, you know, uh, actually Councillor Hopper and I are both uh, great fans of the West Wing. And I remember <laughs> about a year before um, uh, before um, uh, Bartlett's term ends, Leo, the Chief of Staff, calls them all into the office and he writes 365 on the, on the whiteboard. And he says, what are we doing? We're going from one thing to another. We're going from place to place. We've got 365 days to achieve things that we're never going to be able to achieve in the rest of our lives. And I feel that way each day on council too. This is a period of my life where I get to achieve something that I'll never get to do in the rest of my life. So you should seize every moment that you have. And if you are uh, fortunate enough to win the respect of the electors and you uh, do that, I encourage you to seize every moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Kavanagh. I think Councillor Bolton wanted to go first, or Councillor Hopper? Yes, yeah. We'll just keep moving around the table. <laughs> we'll let Councillor Bolton sing us out, I think. Um, look, I'll echo the thoughts of all my fellow councillors by just saying um, sincere gratitude and thanks to my community um, for choosing me four years ago as your voice um, in the South Ward, um, and to my fellow councillors for giving me the opportunity to be the Mayor of this great city in 2014 to 15. It's certainly been an extraordinary honour and privilege. Um, I'd like to congratulate all of my fellow councillors for the extraordinary work that they've done over the last four years. Um, but in particular, um, I won't mention everybody, um, but I would like to thank um, Councillor Gillies, um, who's been a very close friend to me um, and a big support throughout this time on council. I don't think there's a community group in Glenroy or Oak Park that doesn't know Councillor Gilly's name and for me that's the measure of a successful councillor being able to say that your community knows you and is able to go to you um, for help with their questions. Um, I'm sorry that you're not standing again 
Um, I would have liked to spend another four years with you, but I'm sure that we'll see each other often. Um, I'd like to thank um, Councillor Tapanos, who's been a wonderful person to serve alongside in the South Ward. Um, I knew him long before I got onto Council, um, and I've learned a lot from him over the last four years. Um, I hope we'll have the opportunity to do it again um, after, after October 22. Um, our staff from the Bob Hawke Centre to the depot um, to the executive officers here in Coburg are just extraordinary individuals. Um, I had the opportunity to share the experience with Narina um, when she came on board as CEO, um, as her first mayor, um, and we just had an incredible time of it, and it's just such a privilege to work with you every day. Um, our executive assistants, Monica and Helen, um, are really our right arms. I wouldn't know what I'm supposed to be going to any day um, if it weren't for them. Um, so thank you so much to them. Um, and to our directors who really keep us in line. Um, I'll particularly thank the directors that I was a portfolio counsellor to um, during my term, which was Andrew Day and Kirsten Costa, um, who have just, you know, been uh, a real listening post and guiding lights in terms of the work that we do on council. Um, I want to talk about two particular groups in the community um, that I've really heard a lot from over the last four years um, and whose advice and guidance I've really respected and taken a great deal from. Um, the first of those is the women in our community. Um, there's a riddle or a saying, um, how many people does it take to change a light globe? Um, people often make jokes about that. Well, it took 622 women in our community to change 8,500 light globes across Brunswick and Coburg. Um, 622 women signed a petition um, following the tragic death of Jill Ma, calling for greater safety on our streets. And it was because of that petition and the advocacy work that they and other women's groups in our community did um, that we now have 8,500 new light globes across Brunswick and Coburg um, that make it safer to get home at night, but are also decreasing our energy emissions. Um, and of course, uh, community legal centres and all the work that they do for women who are facing family violence um, and other legal issues in our community. Um, I really want to thank all of the women involved in those campaigns and their advocacy. And we wouldn't know um, what to do if it weren't for the advice and the input that they gave us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'd like to, um, I, I've had the opportunity to serve on our libraries committee, our arts board and the series environment park um, for the past four years. Um, and it's been wonderful to work with all of those dedicated and concerned individuals from our community. Um, but in particular, I can't express how much I've valued the deep and heartfelt relationship of mutual respect that I've been able to build with our artistic community. Artists like Ben, Claire, Kimber, Jody, the Haywood sisters, Glenn and Dan, um, Victor and the Coonahan team, They've only fed my conviction that Moorland is Australia's practising artistic capital. Um, and we have so much work to do, but I'm proud that we have seen some um, significant increases to our arts budget over the last four years. And I hope that will only continue in the future. Um, of course, there's nothing like holding an election just as rates notices are issued to remind you what really matters uh, to this community. Um, I'm really proud to be Labor um, and to give a voice to workers and the less well off in this community. Um, it's my belief that we need that voice for workers in our community uh, and people who are doing it tough more than ever. Um, we do need to look at the way we charge rates. Uh, we need to look at our aged and home and community care services. Councillor Bolton has been at the <coughs> forefront of that discussion over the last four years and I commend her for that. Um, and so all I'd say to you in the community is that thank you so much to the workers um, and the people who are doing it tough in our community for always feeding back to us and always giving us the opportunity to be your voice. Um, it's been a real privilege and I hope that we continue to have councillors for the next four years again who will continue to give you that voice. Thank you, Councillor Hopper. Thank you, Councillor Hopper. Councillor Davidson. So it's been quite a dynamic four years and we've had very vigor vigorous debates around this chamber and as some of my fellow councillors have said, it just doesn't stop in this chamber, it continues outside and in many of the meetings that we have with the community, when we meet with the residents, when we meet with them on the street, when we're walking our dog. So it's always continuing and I'd like to thank um, the councillors around this table for all their different opinions um, and as a great democracy that Moreland is we often don't agree with each other and that's why the discussion goes into the hours of the morning and even though I sit there and I sometimes just sit back in my chair and think oh god I wish it would end 
on reflection, it's good. It's good that we're here. It's good that we're debating this and it's a thorough debate. We don't let anything slip by and we don't let things go unnoticed. Um, and many councils have championed various points that, and projects that they'd like to push forward and we've seen those develop and we've seen them grow and I'd like to thank those councillors who have really gotten hold of a project and really run with it in these four years. That's been very admirable. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the CEO, um, a person who I admire greatly for your frank advice and for your calm and passionate nature as well and um, those hours that you've devoted to this council. Um, and also, I'd like to add that a lot of the things we see are physical as well. So we see changes in the way our suburbs are growing, our, um, the way the, the streets are forming. There's those physical things that we can see, but there's also the other side, and that's the community spirit. And that happens when we sit in perhaps an urban planning committee meeting and we see residents come, some who might be elderly, some who need an interpreter, other people who um, have got a little group together and are very passionate about an issue. And that's a community spirit that isn't tangible but happens across council and that's something very valuable. Um, I'd also like to thank the officers who devote all their knowledge. As a councillor, you don't come equipped with knowledge about planning. You don't come equipped with things like about housing affordability, things that I didn't know about. So thank you to the officers for equipping me with that knowledge to be able to make informed decisions. Um, and to the employees of Moreland who work tirelessly um, to serve the community because their service is what gives us value. Um, and to the residents, that's the people I'd like to thank the most. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to stand here and to represent your views. I'm honoured and I'm humbled to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Councillor Bolton. Well, there's um, quite a few thank yous which have um, been repeated, so I might not do all the repeat all the thank yous that have been made already. I'll just um, keep my thank yous um, to two groups, uh, the residents and council workers. And I think the residents play, while it's true we vote, um, and you know, um, but I think the lived experiences of residents are really critical um, to the decisions we make. And it's when those, those um, experiences that are ignored that we're in danger of making wrong decisions. I think when you're not directly affected by an issue, it's very easy to think that issues are trivial, but if you're experiencing them day in, day out, they're not trivial. And I think um, that's why the role of residents in the whole uh, process of local government and influencing change is absolutely critical. I think there are some decisions we would have made which would have been wrong if we hadn't have listened to the residents. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, residents have saved us. And, and you know, because we don't know every single street in Moreland, um, whether we're council officers or, or councillors, we don't know every single street. We don't know all of the issues. Um, we might have a lot of ideas and be very in touch with the community, but we're not going to know everything. And so the, re the role of residents in the whole process is absolutely critical. And not only in uh, stopping us making bad decisions, but also shining a spotlight on important decisions that we need to make or issues that none of us would have thought about before um, being elected. And I think that's where we've really always got to have a very, uh, as councillors, a very open mind um, to issues that um, residents come to us with. And I think um, the comments made earlier by, by Councillor Leader Gillies are really important about um, we can't be bureaucratic with these posts. It's very important not to be. Uh, and also I think it is problematic that it is much easier to be a councillor if you're um, a white collar worker, have flexible work hours, um, but blue collar workers, I think, are underrepresented in these sorts of jobs or these sorts of elected positions. And I think that is problematic because it does chop out a lot of um, the experience of a lot of residents um, from, from the council. Um, so I think that is something that does need to be addressed. I also think um, in... Um, 
I also think in terms of council workers, I think um, council workers have a huge amount of experience and knowledge going across the board from people who collect rubbish to, you know, people who work in, in the offices um, dealing with different situations and certainly I know what I came to be very aware of um, during the whole campaign to reinstate the respite services or after hours respite services for parents of kids with disabilities is that the carers um, are really well loved um, and highly regarded in the, in the community and particularly by families who have those carers, um, some of those carers who've been there for years and have built up long-term relationships with um, some of the disabled children. So I think that's, um, that's, you know, I think council workers play an incredibly important role. I think one of the things coming into this next period is the one of challenge for council amongst many is that a section of our community is experiencing a lot of discrimination and that's particularly the Muslim community. And, you know, just recently I've heard of a woman who was ordered out of a shop um, because people of her kind are not welcome in her shop. Um, and I'm hearing more and more reports like this. And so there is an issue of racism in our community, which we're going to have to address and overcome. Um, I think there are some, um, you know, all sorts of projects that the council has been involved in in the time that um, I've been on council. I think one important one, which um, is couple of years ago now and a year is a long time in politics but the actual campaign which stopped the east west link i think was really really important for all of victoria um, and i think um, moreland played a really important role which i think needs to be remembered and then i just lastly like to advertise end on an advertising note um, there is a play being put on on um, at the end of october um, it is about, it's called uh, 1916, The No Case for Conscription. Um, and uh, this is to commemorate a very important uh, event that Brunswick was the epicentre of and many anti-conscription activists and anti-war activists are imprisoned for um, their views. Um, so I think this is something which uh, people should uh, get along to and support at the Mechanics Institute if you can. And, um, I'd just like to end on that note because that was another great victory which our community, not only our community, but our community all the way back in 1916 and 1917 was involved in. Thank you very much, Mr. And I might just finish things off with the, a few remarks. Um, thank you to all the councillors for their very warm and generous words to their colleagues and to the community. And I want to thank them uh, for their extraordinary work over the last four years. Um, as a number have mentioned, uh, what you see in this chamber is just a glimpse of what a role of a councillor involves. And there's a, a lot of hours, a lot of weeknights, weekdays. There's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of compromise. Uh, but it's for the community's benefit that these councillors sit around this chamber every month and in many meetings all throughout the week, every week for the last four years. So I thank you for all your you have all contributed uh, in new, unique and distinct and positive ways to the future of our city. Um, I remember this moment four years ago when I sat uh, in that, on that side of the chamber um, as the previous council was ending their term. And I remember Councillor Kavanagh, amongst many others, uh, speaking about the end of the four years. And um, it's kind of hard to believe that that four years has now roared uh, so quickly to us. Um, it is a time that moves very quickly, but so much does happen, both professionally and personally, for everyone um, around this table. This council has achieved extraordinary things, and I just want to highlight some of the collective achievements of this council, because I think it is worth noting. Um, there are a lot of struggles and challenges, but through that has come um, great successes. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, I am personally, and um, hopefully my council colleagues share, um, is one of the significant achievements is the establishment of the Zero Carbon Evolution Plan, which is um, makes us one of the few councils across Australia to move to a zero carbon future for our city, showing the way uh, to our state and federal governments who are failing to take um, adequate and fast enough action on the dangerous um, uh, impact of climate change that is before us. Um, 
we have done some, we have been a council that has been regarded for our sustainability work um, over many years, thanks to a number of councillors, so many officers and the community uh, joining in that campaign to be a leader in sustainability. Um, we've got a lot more work to, to do, but I think the establishment of that strategy um, gives us a fantastic platform um, to indeed perhaps be the first community in Australia to become carbon uh, neutral and to be carbon emissions free. We've done some incredible work on deliberative development and looking at the quality of urban development in our city. Um, and particularly this year, we've been doing some work on how we can get more deliberative rather than speculative models of development happening throughout our community. Um, we have a duty to look after our community. Um, the shape of our community is one of the biggest issues um, that, is, that comes to a councillor's attention. Um, and I'm really um, proud of the work that has started um, and looking forward to it progressing. We've done incredible work on affordable um, housing with the establishment of more than affordable housing and the land trust model that um, was a German, uh, germinated that idea. We have uh, committed very significantly into family violence prevention with the launch of our strategy very uh, recently and a commitment of uh, or a spend of at least $175,000 um, of new expenditure on family violence prevention work over the last four years. Uh, we have begun work on an urban forest strategy, urban agriculture and food production strategy, um, which will change the nature of our neighbourhoods as we start thinking about the impacts of climate change and having to mitigate those for our cities. We've increased expenditure on uh, cycling and pedestrian infrastructure, and as we move to a sustainable, a sustainable transport future, those are things that are going to become critical to our community. Um, we've also progressed so um, uh, fantastically towards uh, the next stages of our youth facilities um, up in Coburg, the Oxygen Stage 2 and 3 uh, facility, um, and with an announcement of the, those next uh, phases of the project happening within the next 12 months. We've also launched our human rights policy, um, which has been a landmark achievement for this council. And we've had our first human rights advisory committee meeting just last week, which was a very fitting end to end this four year term with the start of a powerful force this council is yet to see. I think um, it, just in terms of a couple of other highlights, uh, we've just recently heard that Vic Roads is going to begin a process of community consultation on the future of Sydney Road, um, something we've been advocating very strongly alongside our community. And I thank our community for lobbying and advocating so strongly um, to improve the safety on Sydney Road. Um, and that consultation is going to happen over the next few months. And we encourage everyone to get involved in that as we hope to see a transformation on Sydney Road to make it safer for cyclists and pedestrians and public transport users um, and make it a road that works for our community. I think uh, one of our most significant achievements also is uh, welcoming our new CEO, Norina De Lorenzo. She's been a positive and vibrant force for this council. Um, and I think the best is yet to come over the next few years. Um, you're leading a wonderful staff team of which you see the leadership team um, behind us here. And I thank all the directors for your incredible work. There are so many hours that go above and beyond the call of duty that you put in uh, to responding to, uh, to us. And as Councillor Davidson said, to equipping us to be able to do our job properly and we thank all the teams that sit with you um, to achieve uh, what is an incredible feat for um, a council to achieve for a community of um, you know over 100,000 people. Uh, I think some of the highlights for me on council have been my work on council advisory committees. I find them some of the most satisfying work uh, to be a part of and I'd particularly like to mention the reconciliation advisory committee and the disability advisory committee. Um, some passionate and committed people there who've been giving um, hundreds of hours of their volunteer times for years who often don't get much credit for it either. And I'd like to particularly note um, Deb Dean, who's with us in the um, gallery here tonight, who has been on the Disability Advisory Committee for over 15 years and has just moved to the Human Rights Committee. And uh, she's a, she exemplifies uh, the best spirit in our community of trying to um, passion, advocate passionately to improve um, the accessibility and the um, thoughtfulness that a council needs to consider when it builds a city and it transforms a city. So thank you for all your work um, and we can't wait to see your work um, unfold on the Human Rights Committee as well. Um, as a number of councillors have highlighted, uh, there are a number of challenges in this work too. We battle state and federal government legislation. We've seen changes afoot in terms of how local government is regarded by state government, and we've got some challenges in terms of maintaining the autonomy and the power of local government. We are a level of government elected by people to represent people and to care for our community. Um, and I think that autonomy and that power should remain. And this council has been very strong in meeting some of those challenges. Um, there have been... Uh, 
challenges too with the diversity of this council, yet I think we've seen the best come through that in the spirit of cooperation and collaboration um, and compromise that has got us to some fantastic policy and um, actual um, achievements, um, as I've just highlighted before as well. Um, and through some of the difficult times, they can be very difficult times when you have to work through differences. Um, I think I've also seen the very best in my councillor colleagues. Um, and I thank particularly those who stood up for others in times of great need. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Councillor Kavanagh, Councillor Davidson, um, Councillor Lenka Thompson and Councillor Rob Thompson for their moral support over the many years to me personally. Who would have thought local government would make you so emotional, but it does. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Councillor Sue Bolton for your tireless passion and advocacy. You have shaken up council in all the right ways, and I thank you for your incredible activism and commitment to your work. Um, I would like particularly to mention um, two councillors who are not standing uh, for re-election, also which this will make this their last council meeting. Uh, Councillor Rob Thompson, I want to thank you for your ideas your passion, being open to discussion, um, to debate, uh, to putting big ideas on the uh, table of this council chamber. We'll, we'll never talk about a bicycle path or a superhighway the same again um, after your involvement on council. Uh, and we're committed, um, and I hope a future council is committed to seeing those projects through. Um, but thank you for the spirit of cooperation that you've shown. Um, we have worked across difference, and it's taught me a lot about we, are, we might represent different political parties and polit political persuasions, but we're also people and when you have a community interest at heart and you're, ded you're genuinely dedicated to the community, you can achieve great things through difference. And um, our work uh, together has shown us that um, as well. Uh, to my friend and colleague, uh, Lenka Thompson, uh, you have shown a diligence and a conscientiousness, a patience, a kindness, a generosity, and a determination um, unlike I've ever seen before. You have been a real gift to this council and community, and I thank you for your five years of tireless service. Um, you've juggled a lot during that time, but achieved so many great things. Um, you have uh, created a climate um, of cooperation around this chamber, even through some very, very difficult times. And um, at times, we don't all know our full power, and perhaps you might also not know just how much you give um, to this group of councillors, but you have contributed um, so magnificently to the work of this council, and there are so many achievements that you can be so proud of, and they will be your legacy from this term on council. Um, I particularly thank you for your courage. Um, in difficult times, and you are an exemplar of standing up for others uh, when sometimes they're not able to speak up for themselves. So thank you for your incredible tireless work and dedication. Um, and just to conclude, uh, personally, it's been a very fulfilling and rewarding time on council, um, and I concur with all the comments that have come before me. Um, and there are such wide varied experiences. This means different things to everyone, and each experience is just as legitimate and just as authentic. Um, I can think about the last four years. It goes in a flash. Uh, life never goes as fast as when you're a councillor and you're running between meetings. Um, but I guess in that four years, if you reflect on it, if I've reflected on it, um, so much can happen. Um, I was lucky enough to complete my PhD during that time um, on top of council, council work, and I'm happy that's over. <laughs> um, I also got married during that time, and I'd like to um, thank my partner, um, my husband Colin, uh, for all his um, support and commitment. I couldn't, couldn't have got to this, uh, through this without you. Um, and um, also, like many of you, have also maintained jobs um, outside council throughout that time. One of my reasons, uh, one of the reasons I got interested in local government was because we moved around a lot when we were younger and we came to Australia about sort of over 25 years ago now. But that experience of migration taught me just how important it was, uh, just how important your local neighbourhood was. And it's something that has dawned on me more and more as, it, as I've uh, done more years on council. I remember the times when we'd move into a new neighbourhood and you couldn't get anywhere as a kid by yourself. You had to be driven somewhere. And if your parents at work, um, you weren't able to actually get anywhere. So if you couldn't go to the recreation <coughs> centre, you couldn't walk to school, um, it actually limited your ability to make new friends and settle into a new community. But when you did move into spaces where you could walk to and from school because they were accessible and safe, uh, pedestrian parts and cycle parts, you make friends along that journey and soon you have a whole group of people that you're walking home, home with and there begins your life in a new country and a new, and a new uh, suburb. Uh, so through that time, I realised just how important it is that we provide um, open space and footpaths and 
pedestrian um, <coughs> cycle paths uh, and pools and gyms and um, sport and recreation activities for young people, which is why I've been so pleased to be part of the Oxygen Committee for the last four years and see the development of that centre. It makes such an incredible uh, difference to people's lives and often the difference that a council makes in people's lives cannot be seen. It's not tangible, as Councillor Davidson said, but it can be life-changing. Um, so I thank everyone who's been part of uh, that work in making and wanting to make our city a better city for everyone. Uh, and finally, I want to thank all of my fellow councillors and the community for entrusting me with this position um, of the mayor for the last year, which has been uh, the greatest privilege of my life um, to date. Uh, in speaking about migration and moving to many different countries, one thing as a migrant, I'm sure many migrants uh, share this feeling, is that you search for a, a feeling of belonging because that is one of the most elusive things that happens when you have to move multiple times as a child or even as an adult. Uh, and to be elected um, and to have the faith of the community uh, in electing you to a position and the faith of your colleagues to elect you to the position of mayor, there is no greater sense of belonging than that, um, that uh, acknowledgement. So I thank you for that and I hope it speaks to others that uh, no matter how recently you came into this community, this council um, is your council. Uh, we are your community and you are our council and we want you to speak to us. We want you on this, uh, on this side of the chamber as well. And I hope it speaks to everyone, no matter how recently or how long you've been in this community. Um, be a part of your community, change it, uh, work to make it better. Um, and we are genuinely in all of this together and you have a rightful place of belonging in this wonderful community of Moreland. So thank you, councillors. On that note, I'd like to conclude this meeting and bring our council term to an end. Uh, and we'll move to the convention. Thank you, members of the gallery, for joining us. We've got one item in confidential that we have to deal with, so I will now um, ask that we uh, have a motion to move the meeting into confidential business. Councillor Kavanagh, is there a seconder? Councillor Davidson, all those in favour? All those against, I declare that carried. Thank you, members of the gallery. Um, and uh... <coughs> Moreland, like much of Melbourne, is experiencing a population boom. That means our city is changing. Residents are renovating and extending, and developers are looking to build high-density apartment blocks. Moreland City Council plays a large part in how this change will occur. And it's not just the big things you need to come and talk to us about. You might not think you need a planning permit to extend or renovate your home, but you do. Here's a rough guide of when you need to come and talk to council. The Moreland Planning Scheme determines when you need a planning permit and directs how we'll consider your application. Good planning considers the impact a new building or development will have on the character of your neighbourhood and your neighbours things like a heritage overlay, environmental factors such as being close to a creek or waterway that can potentially flood, or even just the size of your block require you to get a planning permit before any work begins. It's important to consider your neighbours in the design phase of your project to avoid overshadowing or privacy issues. In Moreland, we're committed to protecting and enhancing the rich historical fabric of our city. And significant historical sites are protected by heritage overlay. Heritage overlay on a property means you must get a planning permit for all changes to things like fences or even installing solar panels or a water tank. A building permit will ensure that your building is structurally safe and complies with building regulations. It also makes sure that your project is built by registered builders with the correct documentation and essential inspections to be considered safe for occupation. Building permits aren't just for major renovations. You may need a building permit for a new swimming pool, a new fence or garage, even adding a veranda. You can apply to council or a private building surveyor to deal with your building permit application. Well, the land's in the heritage overlay. It's essential to get the correct approvals in place before you start your house renovation to avoid future fines or insurance difficulties. These things can get complicated, so we recommend you make an appointment to come and see us early in your project to discuss your plans.
Woman Jika, welcome and thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening at the Coonahan Gallery in Brunswick for the opening of Both Sides of the Street, um, curated by a respected local Indigenous artist and curator, Kim Thompson. It means having a dialogue that really um, centres and honours the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. And I think what it means also is about doing work that's about solidarity. So not about appropriating other people's stories, not about going off on your own and doing work that you think is solidarity, but actually sitting down and listening. Initially, uh, both sides of the street, um, I, I got the feeling that I was supposed to see that as meaning um, you know, indigenous, non-indigenous artists being on, you know, both sides of the street. Um, but I, I think um, it quickly became obvious to us that, you know, we weren't on both sides of the street and that instead we were on the same side of the street. Well, the, I guess the main um, point about the work, this particular work, is that um, language and, you know, language isn't as simple as just the words and the sounds and um, there are accompanying um, elements like body language, gesture. Both Sides of the Street has a personal meaning for me in a way because I'm mixed and I have to deal with both sides of the street. Like as a collaboration we took both of our identities, our skills and our interests and came up with a project that resonated with that and it's about the historical references of the Kimberley Point which is a implement that was developed to sell to colonials and Europeans and we are investigating the recreation of that implement and its role now. speak English? You're Australia. We've had a stop. We've had a stop. Thank you. Where would you like to take the situation? Yeah. I've seen people being racist towards other people and I've never known what to do. So when this came up I thought that might be really practical because I think more of us should know how to be able to intervene in a safe and effective way. So I guess that's why I came. And the practical tools are how do we engage people rather than confront people or name and shame them. You can't be bothered learning the language. Why don't you go home from where you came from? Oh, wow. Hey, I love your boots. Thanks. Yeah, where'd you get them from? Market. So we want to train people in how to get people asking questions and not clashing and having pitched battles. Then I realised, wow, that's a fantastic way to disengage because I really did come from here. I was really expecting you to attack me to write down here very quickly. So that was really well done. That's what we want to create, social change through little individual interventions. Here at Moreland City Council, we've got a new library for you to try. But this one's a bit different. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You see, our website and e-library are just like another branch. It just never closes. You can download thousands of titles as e-books, subscribe to everything from the Wall Street Journal to Delicious magazine, all delivered right into your hand for free. You can stream your favourite documentaries and indie features. There's even programs for the little ones. With our huge selection of adult, teen and children's titles, you're bound to find something you like. We've got over 7 million songs for you to stream, with everything from Mozart to Jay-Z. 
you're able to work out to your favourite artist just by pressing a button. We've got stories that talk with audiobooks for times when, well, you've got your hands full. And the best thing, like always, it's free with your Moreland Library membership. This is just the next chapter in how our libraries are here to help you. In Moreland, we're all about the good times. At Council, we bring you free events and festivals from our smaller, intimate community celebrations to our large-scale premiere events. We've got your social calendar booked all year round. I get up at 4am every morning, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Keith, I work for Moreland City Council. I'm a sideline operator, and essentially, I'm a garbo. Normally stop off at 7-Eleven to get a coffee in the morning, then yeah, head out at 5.30, start the run. One resident that I pick up from, he's always thankful, he's always there every morning, like every time I come around. Yeah, mate. How you going, buddy? Good day. You know, so it makes you happy when you see that. If you can make their day happy, it makes your day better. You meet a lot of residents from different backgrounds. It's good. I, I like meeting new people. It's, it's warming. We're not doing anything wrong. We're not trying to make your life difficult by moving the bin. Just, we've got to do it so we can pick the bin up safely. We've got to look out for our safety as well. You know, seeing the kids' faces when you come down the street, they love trucks. It's the best part about it. Yeah, it's dirty work, but somebody's going to do it. I'm Dorothy, and I'm 90 years old. Yes, I like to be independent, but... Um, well, you can't be independent all the time, can you? Three years ago, I was in hospital. The sisters at the hospital said, when you leave here, it'd be a good idea to get meals on wheels. I've been giving it ever since. Oh. I've made some lovely friends with the girls that come with the meals. Good morning. Oh, I have it set every Wednesday. Beautiful. But they are lovely and they're very caring. And if I'm not feeling well, well, then I know the meals are still coming. The quality is very good. They're always nice and fresh. Getting the meals delivered was very easy. I had it within a few days. I love me desserts. <laughs> got roast beef today, that looks lovely, doesn't it? Well, I don't think I could manage without the meals on wheels. You'd be surprised how little sleep you can go on and still function and feeling like you need a university degree <laughs> before becoming a parent. My name's Nicole and this is my daughter Eve. My first child, he had an injury from the birth and I was picked up by my maternal health nurse. 
and we were able to put things in place to make sure that didn't become a permanent problem for him. Think about the feed-based sleep pattern. It's a, it's a big trust thing. They're, they're, you're relying on them to make sure everything's going well and to pick up anything that isn't, and they've done that for me, so it's been great. I've had a lot of problems with breastfeeding. The clinic um, is set up here to drop in and they slotted me in for that, for some support there. How to bath, how to feed, what the sleep schedule should be, whether they're thriving or not, all those little details that you've got no idea about. If I didn't have this service, I think I would have had a lot more insecurities about um, raising my children. I, I would have been missing that that sort of peace of mind. I love helping parents to adjust to this new exciting role of parenting. My name is Paul Kondo, I'm an active Moreland member. I've had an issue with my weight all my life. time to actually really do something about it. You accept it as part of your life. It's not just a place where you come to have a workout. It's a social aspect to it. You meet some great people. The instructors here are fantastic. It's a good environment. Uh, my daughter is very proud of what I've achieved so far. I made a promise to her last year that uh, the next time we were going to go to Queensland, I was going to lose enough weight to be able to fit on the rides at the theme park. I kept my promise to her. It's very motivating. You've got a lot of people that come in for the same reasons. They all come in here to work hard. I'm able to run, I'm able to bend over and pick up things without worrying about tipping over. So it's been good, it's been good. Uh, my name's Damien, I work for Moreland City Council as a team leader on one of the ASPRO crew. I know every bakery in Moreland, depending on which job I'm going to. Buongiorno Pasquale. Buongiorno, come on. Come on. Molto bene. Just potholes, general potholes, speed humps, new footpaths, repairs after builders, bike paths, anything that's got ASPRO on we fix. It can be pretty serious, as you can tell, especially for push bikes and mopeds and things like that. Potentially it could cause an accident. We normally get on top of these pretty quickly. The common misunderstanding is that we're lazy, standing around five men looking down a hole when you have to watch. Otherwise they'll go through a gas line or a water line. Some kids love them. They cry as soon as they get taken away. They could sit there all day and watch them. Mostly young blokes. Residents could make my life easier by having uh, a little bit more patience and maybe trying to understand exactly what it is we're doing. Maintaining the roads, making them, keeping them safe for everyone to use. They're all necessary things we have to do, so yeah, I think our job's pretty important. Um, I'm Eddie. to build up a sustainable lifestyle as much as possible so we made the decision first to get solar hot water and we obviously worked a lot on making the garden as kind of sustainable as possible. Solar energy seems like the next logical step. We began by uh, emailing for the discharge and then uh, once we got advice from them um, they put us in touch with Energy Matters. I think having the council approval and having the system already set up uh, just meant that everything at each stage it seemed a lot easier than it might have been. So by going through the Moreland City Council Solar Bot Buy Program you can get a discount exclusive of recommended retail price. Also all the government rebates and incentives are done for you so you'll, all that paperwork's dealt with. Yeah, we've more than halved our bills. We were spending around about $450 on power per six months. In the last six months we spent $160 on power, so we've made a pretty big cut. It looks as though the system will pay itself off within about five
bikes. Yes, we would absolutely recommend this key uh, to other people. We'd recommend Positive Charge. And we'd recommend that, that, that uh, people get in touch and ask some questions. I was looking for a job. The only, the only way I'll probably get a good job is through a course, and, and what better course than you know lifeguarding? My name is Rodwin. I'm a lifeguard here. I watch the pool indoor and outdoor. I was working at a pizza shop, and uh, well, one of my friends from Faulkner, he knows the people from uh, from the council, and and apparently they had this program running, and he told me about the program, and and that I could um, that I could end up working as a lifeguard. I took the job straight away. I like doing a job uh, where I, I'm making sure that people are safe and happy. Yeah, everyone at Oxygen was very nice and um, and uh, very very helpful as well with getting a job and um, and everything. The course really helped with my confidence. They taught me how to how to become a lifeguard, towing, swimming. My family is proud of me and uh, they're very happy as well for me becoming a lifeguard rather than a pizza maker, you know. And I would have also probably been not involved in the same community that, that there is here in pretty much in the Moreland Council and everything. childhood in Sri Lanka uh, and we decided as a family to leave um, around 1987 uh, first migrating to Canada and then coming to Australia over 25 years ago uh, so I'm a social worker uh, by trade uh, and have been working in the settlement sector for the last few years so working with refugees and asylum seekers uh, and supporting them in their transition to making Australia a home well, I've always been interested in social justice um, and environmental justice. Uh, and a few years ago, I was getting more and more frustrated with what was happening at levels of government, uh, and particularly at the federal government. And I decided to join a political party. I joined the Greens. Uh, and from that involvement, started to see what our local councillors were achieving. And it really opened my eyes to the power of local government. Um, so I think it is about ensuring that I'm representing council to the best of my ability, representing my fellow councillors as a group. We are a team working on this together and each councillor comes with different strengths and skills and talents and puts in so much work to make the community better. So I think we've got a significant amount of work to do still in the planning space with a number of planning scheme amendments before the Minister that we will continue to advocate on and hope to get some certainty for the community after years and years of consultation on some of those significant things. I think we've got to look at the infrastructure, uh, the social and transport infrastructure that we build around the changing population, uh, integrated transport, sustainable transport strategies are high on my priority list to ensure that we have better pedestrian and cycling paths for example around the city and I think we've a lot of strategic work to be uh, done. We've had our responsible gaming strategy just passed. I'm really looking forward to starting the imp implementation of it. We've had our zero carbon evolution strategy passed. We're ramping up now our efforts to combat climate change. Uh, and we have a number of other advocacy items that I feel like I want to play a significant role in. Moreland, like much of Melbourne, is experiencing a population boom. That means our city is changing, residents are renovating and extending, and developers are looking to build high-density apartment blocks. Moreland City Council plays a large part in how this change will occur. And it's not just the big things you need to come and talk to us about. You might not think you need a planning permit to extend or renovate your home, but you do. He's a rough guide of when you need to come and talk to council. The Moreland Planning Scheme determines when you need a planning permit and directs how we'll consider your application. Good planning considers the impact a new building or development will have on the character of your neighbourhood and your neighbours. 
things like a heritage overlay, environmental factors such as being close to a creek or waterway that can potentially flood, or even just the size of your block require you to get a planning permit before any work begins. It's important to consider your neighbours in the design phase of your project to avoid overshadowing or privacy issues. In Moreland, we're committed to protecting and enhancing the rich historical fabric of our city. And significant historical sites are protected by heritage overlay. Heritage overlay on a property means you must get a planning permit for all changes to things like fences or even installing solar panels or a water tank. A building permit will ensure that your building is structurally safe and complies with building regulations. It also makes sure that your project is built by registered builders with the correct documentation and essential inspections to be considered safe for occupation. Building permits are just for major renovations. You may need a building permit for a new swimming pool, a new fence or garage, even adding a veranda. You can apply to council or a private building surveyor to deal with your building permit application. Well, the land's in heritage overlay. It's essential to get the correct approvals in place before you start your house renovation to avoid future fines or insurance difficulties. These things can get complicated, so we recommend you make an appointment to come and see us early in your project to discuss your plans. Welcome and thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening at the Coonahan Gallery in Brunswick for the opening of Both Sides of the Street, um, curated by a respected local Indigenous artist and curator, Kimber Thompson. It means having a dialogue that really um, centres and honours the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. And I think what it means also is about doing work that's about solidarity. So not about appropriating other people's stories, not about going off on your own and doing work that you think is solidarity, but actually sitting down and listening. Initially, uh, both sides of the street, um, I, I got the feeling that I was supposed to see that as meaning, um, you know, indigenous, non-indigenous artists being on, you know, both sides of the street. Um, but I, I think um, it quickly became obvious to us that you know, we weren't on both sides of the street and that instead we were on the same side of the street. Uh, well, the, I guess the main um, point about the work, this particular work, is that um, language and, you know, language isn't as simple as just the words and the sounds and um, there are accompanying um, elements like body language, gesture. <laughs> Both sides of the street has a personal meaning for me in a way because I'm mixed and I have to deal with both sides of the street. Like as a collaboration we took both of our identities, our skills and our interests and came up with a project that resonated with that. And it's about the historical references of the Kimberley Point which is a implement that was developed to sell to colonials and Europeans and we are investigating the recreation of that implement and its role now. Speak English, you're Australia. Mm -hmm. We've had a stop. We've had a stop. Thank you. Where would you like to take the situation? Yeah. 
I've seen people being racist towards other people and I've never known what to do. So when this came up, I thought that might be really practical because I think more of us should know how to be able to intervene in a safe and effective way. So I guess that's why I came. And the practical tools are how do we engage people rather than confront people or name and shame them. You can't be bothered learning the language. Why don't you go over where you came from? Oh, wow. Hey, I love your boots. Thanks. Yeah, where'd you get them from? Market. So we want to train people in how to get people asking questions and not clashing and having pitched battles. Then I realised, wow, that's a fantastic way to disengage because I really did come from here. I was really expecting you to attack me to write down here very quickly. So that was really well done. That's what we want to create, social change through little individual interventions. Here at Moreland City Council, we've got a new library for you to try. But this one's a bit different. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You see, our website and e-library are just like another branch. It just never closes. You can download thousands of titles as e-books, subscribe to everything from the Wall Street Journal to Delicious magazine, all delivered right into your hand for free. You can stream your favourite documentaries and indie features. There's even programs for the little ones. With our huge selection of adult, teen and children's titles, you're bound to find something you like. We've got over 7 million songs for you to stream, with everything from Mozart to Jay-Z. You're able to work out to your favourite artists just by pressing a button. We've got stories that talk with audiobooks for times when, well, you've got your hands full. And the best thing, like always, it's free with your Moreland Library membership. This is just the next chapter in how our libraries are here to help you. Moreland, we're all about the good times. At Council, we bring you free events and festivals, from our smaller, intimate community celebrations to our large-scale premiere events. We've got your social calendar booked all year round. I get up at 4am every morning, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Keith, I work for Moreland City Council. I'm a sideline operator, and essentially, I'm a garbo. I normally stop off at 7-Eleven to get a coffee in the morning, and yeah, head out at 5.30, start the run. One resident that I pick up from, he's always thankful, he's always there every morning, or every time I come around. Yeah, mate. How you going, buddy? Good day. You know, so it makes you happy when you see that. If you can make their day happy, it makes your day better. You meet a lot of residents from different backgrounds. It's good. I, I like meeting new people. It's, it's warming. We're not doing anything wrong. We're not trying to make your life difficult by moving the bin. Just, we've got to do it so we can pick the bin up safely. We've got to look out for our safety as well. You know, seeing the kids' faces when you come down the street, they love trucks. It's the best part about it. Yeah, it's dirty work, but somebody's going to do it.
I'm Dorothy and I'm 90 years old. Yes, I like to be independent, but um, well, you can't be independent all the time, can you? Three years ago, I was in hospital. The sisters at the hospital said, when you leave here, it'd be a good idea to get meals on wheels. I've been giving it ever since. I've made some lovely friends with the girls that come with the meals. Good morning. Good morning. Your hair looks good. Uh, I have good. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Well done, councillors. Uh, now, could I please motion to open public cabinet on a, a seconder to move to the public? Link, I think, put her, she, her last motion to put her hand up for it. I think she <laughs> snuck in there. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. And I declare that council meeting closed. Sorry.